All right, we're going to get started. Good evening. Good evening. Today is Monday, August 14th, 2023. The time is now uh, 537. Thank you so much for joining us in Contois Auditorium and online for the Burlington City Council meeting. We're going to begin our evening with item 1.1, which is a motion to adopt our agenda. And uh, I would entertain a motion to adopt the agenda um, as well if someone could please read the motion. Uh, do I have a do I have a volunteer? Nobody wants to volunteer. Civic clerk. The motion is listed in there um, as up to date as I believe it is. Is that correct, Lori? Yes. So there is a there is a not a lengthy but a. Couple of couple of lines there. I'd move to. Okay, are we good? <laughs> okay, all right. All right. I'll, I'll move to amend and adopt the agenda as follows: Add to the consent agenda item 5.47, special event outdoor entertainment permit application, two days only. The Pinery, 377 Pine Street. Add to the consent agenda item 5.48, communication from Robert Bristow Johnson regarding new erosion at Bike Bridge in Mays Landing. Add to the consent agenda item 5.49, communications, Celine Colburn and Rachel Siegel, read double standard in the city's treatment of former REIB director Taisha Green. Note that agenda item 6.4, annual report for 2022-23, Parks, Recreation and Waterfront Commission is postponed to the next council meeting September 11th, uh, per City Council President Paul. Thank you so much, Councillor Travers. Is there a second to that motion? Uh, thank you, Councillor Bergman. Uh, is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, uh, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion to approve and approve our amended agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That means we have an agenda. Uh, the second item on our agenda is 2.1, which is a communication, Mayor Moreau Weinberger and Airport Director Nick Longo regarding negotiation of an agreement with VTANG regarding capital investments. Um, as, as it has been our practice, um, uh, we often go to the administration if there is anything that can be provided in open session because this is a discussion of negotiating a contractual agreement and there is an ex expected executive session to follow. Sir President Paul, so you're asking if there's any updates for an open session? Yes. Um, the... Um, we do have agreements that we are in discussions with the guard about, and um, it would it would uh, uh, be prematurely impact the public if we were to have discussions about them. Uh, so that's why we requested the executive session. Great, thank you. Uh, and and I just say further, I, we're not expecting action on this uh, tonight. Okay, so there will be no action that will be taken on this item. This is simply for an update for the and a communication for the council. Um, Councilor Barlow, um, if you could please make the first motion to go into executive session. Uh, sure. I move that the council find that premature general public knowledge of information concerning contract negotiations of an agreement with Vermont Air National Guard regarding capital investments would clearly place the city at a substantial disadvantage with such negotiations. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Uh, a motion has been made to, or actually this is just the first of two motions. Would there be a second to that motion? Seconded by uh, Councillor King. Is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion as presented by Councillor Barlow, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That motion passes unanimously. Now based on that, uh, that motion, uh, Councillor Barlow, if you could make the second motion. Sure. Uh, based upon that finding, 
I move that the Council go into executive session to receive information regarding agreement negotiations with Vermont Air National Guard under 1 VSA section 313A1A. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Councillor King. Uh, is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, and I, I actually neglected to add to that motion that um, in addition to the mayor and the airport director, there will be other, or will there be anyone else joining us in that executive session? Uh, the CAO, the city, city attorney, um, mayor's office staff. Mayor's office, city, uh, the C city attorney, CAO Shad, and members of the mayor's office. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have planned for this executive session to last about 30 minutes. We're going to go downstairs because there are a number of people that are joining us by Zoom. Um, so everyone can sit in here and be comfortable. We will be going downstairs and we hope to be back in about a half an hour. Uh, the time is now uh, 6.09. We have a couple of minutes left uh, before we get to public forum, which starts at 6.15. And with those couple of minutes, we are going to use them for the local control commission meeting that we need to attend to this evening. Um, so with that, we will recess the city council meeting at 6.09 and uh, call to order the local control commission meeting at the same time at 6.10. Um, the first item on that agenda is item 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? I move to adopt the agenda. Thank you, Commissioner Shannon. Uh, seconded by... Uh, Commissioner Travers, is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That motion passes. We have an agenda. Our next item is item number two, which is the consent agenda. Is there a motion to move the consent agenda? Uh, Commissioner Shannon. Move to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Thank you very much. Seconded by uh, Commissioner Travers. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That motion passes unanimously, which leads us to our deliberative agenda and item 3.1, which is a second class store liquor license application 2023-2024 for Always Full Asian Market, LLC. Uh, Commissioner Shannon. Move to approve the 2023-2024 second class uh, state liquor license application for Always Full Asian Market, uh, doing business as Always Full Market Burlington, 179 Bank Street, with the following conditions. All city permits need to be closed out, contingent upon fire marshal approval, and with all standard conditions. Thank you, Commissioner Shannon. Seconded by uh, Commissioner Travers. Uh, is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed, please say no. That motion passes unanimously. And seeing no other items on the agenda and hearing no objection, we'll adjourn the local control commission meeting at 612 and return to the recess council meeting at that same hour. Um, I did want to also acknowledge that we do have uh, Councillor McGee, who is joining us by Zoom. Um, and we do expect to have uh, Councillor Carpenter also joining us um, for the deliberative agenda. Um, Councillor Jang is actually in Senegal, working on a sister city relationship with a city in Senegal and is not going to be joining us this evening. Um, and for those who missed when we first started the meeting, thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. We will move on to the time is now close to 6.15 and we will move on to public forum. Before we begin the public forum, we have a lot of people that are here who perhaps have not been to public forum before. Um, and for that, I, for them and for all of us, I will describe the process. Um, for those that are in Contois, we have a timer system on the table that's in front of me and it has three lights on it. The first is a green light that will shine when you begin speaking. The second is a yellow light when you have 30 seconds left. And the last is a red light that will shine when your time is up. 
We ask that you please complete your sentence if you're mid-sentence or in the middle of a, uh, in the middle of a, a, a thought, um, that you please complete that sentence um, when the light and the, sh and the sound indicate that your time is up so that everyone has the same amount of time uh, to speak and we can keep the public forum moving along. Um, if you're joining us online, and there are a number of people that have signed up to speak online, um, we have a timer syst system that is set up on Zoom. We don't have a light system, but when your two minutes is up, the clock will wind down to zero, and we just ask that you complete your thoughts and your sentence at that time so that we can move on to the next community member. We have a hybrid system for public forum, so if you wish to speak in person, there are forms um, on my right in the back corner of the room. You can just simply fill out that form. It's helpful if you um, mention the item that you're here to speak to um, and uh, just give that form to the clerk that, is, that just gave me a number of, a number of, a number of forms. Um, if you are wishing to speak on Zoom, and please do not sign up for both, um, you can go to burlingtonvt.gov slash city council slash public forum and a form will come up. Please complete the form and the answers to that form come into a spreadsheet that I have on my computer in front of me so that I can call on you in the order in which you submitted a form. It has been our practice that Burlington residents have first priority to speak. We will go to Burlington residents in Contois who have submitted a form in person, then to Burlington residents online who have completed an online form, back to non-Burlington residents in person, and then we will finish with online non-Burlington residents. Uh, during public forum, other than keeping to the time, we only have one other request, and that is that you please use respectful language. We would like to remind everyone here this evening that there are a number of families who sometimes join us in person and also join us online who watch city council meetings as their connection with civic engagement in teaching their children about respectful public discourse. Uh, please keep that in mind when you speak. Um, please direct your comments to me as the chair and not to anyone else at this table. And do not personalize your comments. Again, we are here to very intently listen to your comments and it's a lot easier for us to listen if you do so respectfully. We will, with that, we will get started. And I apologize, we were, down in we were down in executive session, so I don't have these completely organized, but um, I do have two that are here. The first two are Burlington residents. The first is Jacqueline Posley, uh, to be followed by Raven Have Havens. And if you could come forward, thanks, good evening. And you just need to press the button that's right in front, right there, so the green light Hi, comes on. Hi, can everyone on. hear me? Yes. Hi. Great. My name is Jacqueline Posley. I am a born Mississippian living in Vermont. And this is something I wrote called Beneath the Surface, a black paper on Vermont's most diverse city. Please allow me to begin by congratulating the city's marketing team for a job well done. For many years, this city has had a reputation for being one of America's most diverse and welcoming communities. We All Belong campaigns, All Are Welcome Here signs, BIPOC this and BIPOC that, the list goes on. You have impeccably curated the image of America's liberal utopia, which in essence is exactly the role of the marketing team. Job well done. However, what is happening beneath the surface? Beneath the surface, you have multiple police chiefs who create social media accounts to target residents. Beneath the surface, you offer hefty compensation packages as consolation to officers who brutally assault and sometimes kill black people. Beneath the surface, your only black identifying member of the police commission stepped down citing concerns of oppression. Beneath the surface, you cycle through black female equity directors like they are disposable and interchangeable. Beneath the surface, Burlington City Arts dismantles their already dormant committee on equity and belonging. Beneath the surface, your girls basketball team, a group of minors, children, are calling on you and begging each of you to address what they have called a culture of racism. 
from the mouths of babes, children so young they are barely eligible for a driver's license. We hear the same unified cry that black people have been screaming from the mountaintops for centuries. Hear us, help us, protect us. This place claims to be a sanctuary city and welcome refugees and asylees with open arms and is simultaneously doing everything in their power to stifle the voices of black people. Shame. The attack on Taisha's character. If you can, you certainly finish your sentence, please. Sure. The attack on Taisha's character more than a year after she left this role is no different than any of the other tactics this city employs to keep black people in their place. This is a witch hunt that will be used to say, see, it was her, it wasn't us. See, we have another black woman who is in this role and who is performing just fine. See, thank, thank we are you. really a welcoming city. Please allow me to end by congratulating the city's marketing team for a job well done. Thank you. Raven? I'm Raven. Yes. Um, before, hold on just, just a moment. Um, we, um, I didn't mention this as one of the requests that we make, but we do make a request that we not clap. Um, and, the reason, and the reason is so that we can continue moving the public forum along. If you want to show your, if you want to show your support for a speaker, you can simply do it silently like this, and we will see you. Raven, please go ahead, welcome. Hi there, thank you for having me. Um, I've been a member of this community for quite a while, living here in Vermont for 14 years. I am a, a member of the Mohawk tribe, also Wyandotte, and I am, um, I just stand with solidarity with my brethren here, and I am let down time and time again by the atrocities I see around the city, around the state, and I, can't stand by it very much longer. I just want to send my love and pour my heart out to these folks. You all belong to be here with me. I love you all and I will stand by your side. Thank you. So our next speaker is Farine Paris Meyer to be, to be followed by Katerina Campbell. Good evening. Before I start, I just want to make sure I understand the rules. I'm supposed to focus on you, Karen, and speak this narrative to you. I yes. just, I just want to yes. be sure. Okay. That would be that would that would be great, okay. Green. And just make sure that you're close enough to the microphone so we can hear you. Okay. Thank Hello. you. Hello. Hi. My name is Farreen Paris Meyer. I am black. I am a woman, I am an educator, I am queer, I am an activist, I'm a Burlington resident, I'm a first generation student, I'm living with anxiety, I'm financially struggling, and I find myself questioning life. As someone who is a black woman, who has to move through this community with such a mask sometimes, we're expected to hide our pain, hide that we are not doing well, hide all these different parts that unfortunately allows white people and white supremacy culture to think I am a robot, to think as if I'm not human, to think that I can keep going no matter how hard you kick my black behind area down. And I, Karen, am asking you to let me know what you will do as council president this evening to ensure that we are not aligning this agenda to support a mayor of our city that has lasted a witch hunt on former director Taisha Green since he was made seen for his 
mishandling of the CNA report of 2021. There is a reason why three years later, we are bringing up finances, we are bringing up things that have been allocated and closed down. This is a witch hunt on former director Taisha Green because Miro has done his time here and anybody who spends this level of energy and ego and pride and pettiness and surround yourself with yes people to take a black woman out means that you are in for something for yourself following your time as mayor. And you take out your threat. And I'm going to put that out there because while we not check our facts while we not do our due diligence to ensure that we're hiring actual auditors and not lawyers to put Taisha Green's life on the line. There is no responsibility while y'all get to go home and put your head down at night while we sit and die over and over in our bodies. So I will step away. Our community will come forward. But Miro, your witch hunt on this queen ends today. Thank you, thank you. Our next speaker, our next speaker is Katerina Campbell to be, to be followed by Romeo Herman. Katerina, hi. Okay. Hello, can folks hear me? Yes. Thank you for All right. I think the mic is cranked. I'm going to speak loudly. Good evening. My name is Katerina Campbell from Burlington. I'm here speaking on behalf of myself. I am here in solidarity with Taisha Green, Casey Ellerby, Black Femmes, non binary and trans folks, and women throughout Vermont who have or are currently experiencing racial and gender based discrimination, harassment displacement, and terrorism. I have lived in Vermont since 2007, Burlington since 2011, and when I think of civil service and public service, no one embodies that more than Taisha Green, Farine Paris Meyer, Kaya Morris, the list goes on, Zariah Hightower. We demand an end to the practices and abuse that former director Green, Casey Ellerby, and others have experienced we demand a full public articulation of harm from Mayor Mira Weinberger and the city of Burlington to Taisha Green, Casey Ellerby and their families for the continued defamation of character and unwarranted actions taken throughout city processes like the audit itself. We demand ongoing independent evaluation and oversight of the hiring and retention policies and solutions employed by the city of Burlington to combat anti-BIPOC and gender-based discriminatory practices. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Romeo Herman to be followed by um, Rachel Siegel, Julie Masuga. You wish to speak together? Yes? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you for having me, Madam President. I am going to be uh, speaking to a different topic. I know today is a very passionate day, so I will uh, stick to the point. Uh, my name is Romeo. I am a resident here, and I'm here to talk about the uh, pressing issue that is a retail theft that is ongoing in our city that is also a chronic issue. This perpetual situation is not only causing devastation to businesses, but also jeopardizing the safety and well-being of residents in this city. It is high time that we take a resolute and proactive actions and stance to tackle this issue head on and seek meaningful resolutions to protect the city, its businesses and residents. As we gather here today, let us acknowledge that retail theft is not merely a nuisance. It is a symptom of larger underlying issues such as mental health, challenges, substance abuse that inflict in our community. We cannot afford to ignore the human toll of these problems, nor can we turn a blind eye to the damages that they inflict on businesses in our city and overall quality of life for everyone. The impact of this ongoing and unabated chronic retail issue, 
theft on businesses rather cannot be overstated. Small and large enterprises alike suffer significant financial losses, leading to potential layoffs, higher prices, and even business closures. We cannot accept that continue to keep happening in our city, especially for somebody myself who works at uh, market uh, the marketplace. I do see that business closing every single day. That being said, when businesses, including retails, are forced to pass the losses on to customers, it creates a vicious cycle that further exacerbates the economic challenges faced by our city. The vibrancy of our shopping districts and commercial centers are at risk. This directly affects the, vi the vitality of our city. Furthermore, we cannot overlook the connection between I, thank you, ma'am. Please complete that sentence. Thank you, Madam President. Furthermore, we cannot overlook the connection between ongoing and unabated chronic retail theft and mental health, as well as substance abuse, and I hope that we can come together and find a resolution that we can work together. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Romeo. Uh, our next speaker, so uh, Rachel, Julie, you just want, you each want to read the same, you want to read the same letter, and you each want your two minutes. Okay, so one of you will start and the other will, you will hand the letter to the other. Yes? Okay. Welcome. Oh. Just make sure you have the microphone on. Is it on now? It is. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This letter was written by Selena Colburn and myself, and Julie has offered to read it since Selena can't be here tonight. We are writing as past city councilors, white anti-racist accomplices, and open-hearted humans. We see a clear and problematic double standard in the city's treatment of former REIB director Taisha Green. While we served on city council and in subsequent years, we've observed multiple examples of questionable behaviors by city of Burlington department heads, mostly white men, and by the administration itself. Rarely, if ever, have we seen the degree of scrutiny and investigation that Taisha Green is experiencing. The contrast is stark and unwarranted. A few examples. Former CEDO director Peter Owens left his position with the city of Burlington in May 2016. Owens was already scheduled to step down from his role as CEDO director, a position that is instrumental in setting the vision for Burlington's affordable housing policy, but resigned early in response to a scandal he was involved with in San Francisco. Owens was the landlord of a 100-year-old Iris Canada, an African-American woman he was working to evict from her home of over 50 years. The eviction was halted by a San Francisco judge, scrutinized by the president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, the equivalent of Burlington City Council, and widely covered by the media. On February 10th, 2017, without notice and while she was in the hospital, Owens removed all of Canada's belongings and denied her and her family access to them. This included medical supplies, family photos, ID cards, her deceased husband's artworks, and more. No formal critique or inquiry into Owen's actions, values, or past work was supported by the city of Burlington's administration. In April 2023, the community of Burlington learned that our then acting chief of police was the subject of a formal complaint after using a menacing tone and threatening to cuff a medical provider at the University of Vermont Medical Center. This happened as part of a dispute about police presence during the provision of medical care to a victim of gun violence. The existence of the complaint was withheld from the city council for months and from the public as it considered a ballot initiative regarding police oversight, even as it was referred to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council for further investigation. And might I ask, was that investigation ever completed? I don't believe the public knows, and yet he was appointed to a permanent position with, as far as we know, an investigation open about him threatening to punch a doctor. Why is he not being scrutinized? In January of this year, the Vermont State Auditor completed an audit of Burlington's Lakefront Tax Increment Financing TIF District. The audit showed, quote, years of sloppy record keeping and financial mismanagement, while noting that Burlington had made millions of dollars of mistakes. Much of this was attributed to poor record keeping, key staff turnover, and slow adoption of strategies recommended by the city's own auditors. The city's errors were so numerous in so many different types, it is clear a new process is required to reduce the risk of significant errors in the future. 
The result was well over a million dollars of debt to the state's education and TIF funds. According to the Burlington Free Press, the city's response letter noted that, quote, the city's budget is flexible enough to handle unexpected expenses like this because of its unassigned fund balance, which must always contain 5 to 15 percent of the city's annual operational expenses, and that even with the withdrawal of money to resolve audit findings, the city's fund remains above 10 percent of its expenses. To our knowledge, there has been no broad public accounting for how the city intends to rectify the issues raised or avoid similar debt outcomes in the forthcoming state audit of the downtown TIF district. The accusations against Ms. Green appear to be emblematic of a citywide culture, not of any personal shortcomings. In fact, in the review recommendations, it states clearly that the city needs to clarify and become more consistent. need to wrap up. We have so much work to do as a city. We cannot understand the administration's decision to spend precious time and resources on an investigation that seems so out of alignment with previous responses you. and creates further division in our community. We stand in solidarity with the black women of Burlington who are speaking out. Thank you. Uh, our, next, our next speaker is uh, Max Tracy to be followed by uh, Aspen Overy. Good evening, Max. Good evening. Wish it was under better circumstances. I think that tonight I just want us to not lose sight of who Taisha Green is and what she's done for our community. Taisha Green is a leader of unquestioned integrity who always, in my conversations with her, would come back to say something along the lines of, always tell the truth. The truth will set you free. So when a report comes out that alleges that, that Taisha is saying has misinformation in it, I believe Taisha. Because in everything that I'd work, in, in all of my work with Taisha Green in the two years that she was here, she, in my mind, was someone of unquestioned integrity. And we can't lose sight of that. We also cannot, cannot lose sight of everything that Taisha did for our community. She started the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Department from scratch in the middle of COVID and also started one of the biggest and most successful events our city has ever seen in Juneteenth. So let's not lose sight of that. That's incredible work and something that needs to be highlighted more. Um, well, and, and, and quite frankly, has not been spoken to in the context of this report. Um, no one's been saying or recognizing Taisha, and it really is deeply, deeply wrong. I think the other thing I want to say is also that, as my uh, co former colleagues on the council just pointed out, this behavior is different, or this, the treatment that Taisha is experiencing is entirely different than other white department heads have faced, and that is racism. That is racist. Plain and simple. That is racist, Max. and it needs to be called out as such. Max. And finally, the last thing I want to say is you need to think through the implications of when you do something like this. Because when you, when you write a report like this, when you put a report out there, you open the door for racists to walk through and to threaten and to harm black people in our community. That is what you've done. You have caused harm to black people in our community and that harm is only just beginning. Uh, our next speaker, our next speaker is Aspen Overy to be followed by Josh Meyer. I'm here to just echo the sentiments and read a letter written that for allies to say. So, hi, my name is Aspen from Burlington, and I'm here in solidarity with Taisha Green, Casey Ellerby, and Black Femmes, non-binary, and women throughout Vermont who have or are currently experiencing racial and gender-based discrimination, harassment, and displace displacement and terrorism. Uh, everyone here demands an end to the practices and abuse that former Director Green, Casey Ellerby, and others have experienced. Uh, demand a full, a full public articulation of harm from Mayor, from Mayor Murrow Weinberger and the city of Burlington to Taisha Green, Casey, Casey Ellerby, and their families for the continued definition of character and unwarranted actions taken through city processes like the audit itself, and demand an ongoing independent evaluation and oversight of the hiring and retention policies and solutions employed by the city of Burlington to combat anti-BIPOC and gender-based discriminatory practices. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Josh Meyer, to be followed by uh, Joanne Margaret Brown.
Good evening. My name is Josh Meyer of Burlington. I am here in solidarity with Taisha Green, Casey Ellerby, and Black Femmes, non-binary, and women throughout Vermont who have, are, who have or are currently experiencing racial and gender-based discrimination, harassment, displacement, and terrorism. I am in a multiracial family, and we have been living in this city for over 10 years. We've experienced the impacts. Why don't we, um, Josh? We'll hold the we'll hold the clock for a minute. We just start again at ten minutes. Thank you. Take your time. We have experienced the impacts of systemic and blatant racism, which have taken an immeasurable immeasurable toll on our family. We have found racial slurs written on our family car, and have left our jobs due to experiences with racism at the institutions we served. <laughs> While whiteness has provided me with shelter, as black women, Farine and the girls remain under constant attack. We continue to lose magical black and brown individuals in this community, like Taisha. Whether they are new to Burlington or have grown up in this area, hope for change is replaced by heartache when there is a realization that this community does not truly see and embrace them fully. Burlington folk are highly skilled at promoting diversity and talking about equity, but what are we actually doing to make people of color feel at home with opportunities and an environment that make talented people want to stay in this city? A highly deceptive brand of racism is ubiquitous, permeating city offices, local businesses, and schools. Each time a BIPOC community member leaves, it takes a toll on people of color in this community. Our family questions whether this place will love us back. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is um, Joanne Margaret Brown, to be followed by Madison. I thought, I thought you were going to go to the Zoom people first. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I thought you were going to go to the Zoom people first. Um, okay, I'm. My apologies. I wasn't really sure you didn't have an address, um, a full address here, um, but you're here, so please go ahead, and we'll and we'll we'll continue on. Okay. Thank you for thank you for noting that. Okay. Um, uh, I'm here. Uh, if you could just use the microphone that's right in front of you. Right. Thank you. Okay. I'm here in an effort to openly to, to, to disparage the recent performance of uh, recently elected Senator. Um, Welch, Peter F. Welch, uh, recently on the House side, Miss um, Becca Balint uh, abdicated her responsibility to the Budget Committee. She was renamed um, to the um, prestigious Judiciary House Judiciary Committee, and uh, at least one subcommittee, and. Uh, I come here to indicate that um, Ms. Balint is, is not a, practice, a practicing att an attorney. She, most of her time spent here in the state was as a middle school educator. She is not well prepared to step into jobs that are ordinarily held almost exclusively by attorneys. Additionally, she is, um, her life partner is Elizabeth Voltz. Elizabeth Voltz is, in fact, an attorney. Um, she, she, Voltz was educated at uh, Harvard University in Boston. Um, she, uh, Voltz worked for uh, Downs, Racklin, Martin in this area. And uh, Voltz is, I believe, a sister to um, the gentleman that headed up the um, education department in this state some time ago. Ms. Balint is Harvard educated also, but in education. And we feel that, um, I personally feel, that Balint has abdicated her first responsibility to the budget committee in an effort to take on the more prestigious um, responsibilities Thank you. Of the House Judiciary Committee. Thank you so much. 
Our next speaker is Madison to be followed by Jenna Emerson. Good evening. Good evening. In his 2021 State of the City Address, Mayor Weinberger asked all Burlington residents to imagine a future where we have eliminated racial disparities and where everyone in the Burlington community feels true belonging. From the Mayor's Address, committing that the city will place racial justice and racial equity at the center of work going forward, the Mayor said, I know that words are not enough, and so as I speak tonight, I also will detail how I intend to follow up these words with actions in the months and years ahead, including and especially by elevating and supporting the work of many partners, organizations, and BIPOC leaders. Pursuing three major initiatives to promote a greater sense of belonging in Burlington, the mayor committed to sponsoring the city's first annual Juneteenth celebration as a result of the REIB department's initiative and leadership developing an actionable plan to eliminate the disparity in home ownership among black Burlingtonians and continue to grapple with public safety transformation. I repeat Mayor Weinberger's words as a call of action or a call to action for the city council. To one, make clear the findings of the REIB audit which show no wrongdoing on the part of former director Taisha Green. Two, make clear that Director Green oversaw a resoundingly successful and unimpeachable Juneteenth 2021, wherein she was visionary, fundraiser, and executive manager of the event in total. Three, that findings of mismanagement as regards the 2022 Juneteenth celebration must make clear that Director Green resigned at the top of March 2022, and BCA, BCA staff and outside organizations were responsible in entirety for the June 17th execution and management of that event. Four, note a pattern of bias as regards the mayor's execution of oversight when implications of mismanagement have been directed towards other department heads. As Mayor Weinberger's former campaign treasurer and re-election advisor, I'd like to highlight a well-documented and self-professed case of bias by the mayor. In his own words, I'm not asking Director Taisha Green to manage this assessment, the study of the Burlington Police Department. I belie the deep respect and appreciation that I have for her. If you can this wrap decision up. was wrong and reveals my own bias. Thank you. Our next speaker is our next speaker is Jenna Emerson, to be followed by. Um, Levi Silverstein. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jenna Emerson of Burlington Ward 2, and I am here in solidarity with Taisha Green and Casey Ellerby. I have lived in Burlington for six years, and in that time, I have seen too many phenomenal, brilliant black femmes, women, and trans folks leave or get pushed out of this community because of the relenting burden of the combination of misogyny and racism which is misogynoir, a, a term coined by black feminist Moya Bailey. Juneteenth 2021 and 2022 was full of black beauty and joy and was one of the most impactful city events I've ever attended. It is a shame that Taisha's character and integrity are put into question through an attempt to sully these amazing events and people. And I am here in solidarity with others in this room demanding justice. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is um, Levi Silverstein to be followed by Leah Malone. Good evening. I hope I got your name right this time. You did, yeah, 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 it was great. Uh, it was Silverstein, but it's okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, good evening, members of the Burlington City Council. My name is Levi Silverstein. I'm an outpatient pharmacy technician at UVMMC. Some of you may remember me. I spoke in front of you a few weeks ago. I was the guy with the broken phone. Still broken, don't have the money to fix it, but that's not why I'm here. Um, it's come to my union's attention that UVMMC has been in touch with some of you council members or all of you in an attempt to influence the outcome of tonight's uh, resolution in support of the UVMMC Support Staff United. My sincere hope is that all of you told them to stuff it. Uh, if you didn't or are still on the fence about supporting the working poor in our city, allow me to remind you why we're fighting. UVMMC is the largest employer in the state. However, over 50% of the employees in my 2,300 person bargaining unit make less than $20 per hour. According to the 2022 Vermont Basic Needs Budget and Livable Wage Report published by the Vermont Legislative Joint Fiscal Office, 
The minimum livable wage for a single person living in an urban area such as Burlington and Vermont is $20.03. For a single parent with one child living in an urban area, that wage increases to $35.50. Even in a household with two working adults and two children, the base livable wage for just one parent is $25.97. Allow me to repeat myself, over 50% of the employees in my 2,300 person bargaining unit make less than $20 an hour. So according to this report, as well as the testimonials of countless UVMMC employees, it is clear we are underpaid and the hospital is fine with keeping it that way, as indicated by the minimum wage of their most recent proposal being less than $18. We, however, are not, and that's why we formed a union, or an onion, if you say it wrong. It's also worth noting that the most recent, it's also worth noting the inherent racism of their most recent wage proposal, which keeps the two most diverse departments with the most new Americans starting under that $20 line. UVMMC has made some attempts to sway your votes against us. I implore you, do not allow them to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is, our next speaker is Liam Malone, to be followed by Robert Bristow Johnson. Is it on? It is okay. on. This is scary as a white, masculine presenting person. So, um, thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Liam Malone. I was born in southern Vermont and I grew up between Bennington County and Burlington, Vermont. Um, I am here in solidarity with Taisha Green, Casey Ellerby, and Black Femmes, non binary, and women throughout Vermont who are currently experiencing racial and gender-based discrimination, harassment, displacement, and terrorism. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Bristow Johnson to be followed by Bethany Whitaker. And now for something completely different. So um, I don't envy you guys at all. 500 page agenda packet. Uh, so on page 440 on that, um, you're gonna see some um, photographs. And I wanna tell you the story behind the photographs. So this has happened at least twice since I've lived here. Uh, 12 years ago, it was called Irene, and then it was last month. And uh, um, some of you might remember going to the, uh, the dam at Winooski and seeing this apocalyptic thing. And all of that water has to end up in my neck of the woods, up uh, in Ward 7. And um, uh, uh, I'm up by the bike bridge. And uh, uh, all of this water is coming south from the Colchester boat launch. And something has to exert a force on it to divert it to go west. And that something is, in its entirety, dirt and tree limb. And it's eroding very rapidly at an alarming rate. And so then what's happening is, right since that happened, just regular flow of the river has eroded a structure next to the bike bridge that is threatening the footings of the bike bridge, at least it will, within a decade. So I don't want any level of government to be absolved of worrying about this, city, state, FEMA, uh, but this is going to be expensive, and it's only going to get more expensive with delay, and you have to do it unless the alternative is that maybe for the next generation we don't have a bike bridge for our kids. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bethany Whitaker to be followed by uh, Jacob Berkowitz. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Hi. I'm here to talk about something different. So, um, And I'm here to talk about the Burlington Electric Commission. I'm a member of the Burlington Election Electric Commission. I think you all know it's a five-member advisory board that meets monthly. Um, there's also opportunities to participate virtually. I know there's been a lot of questions about Burlington Electric recently and the McNeil plant. 
and also district energy. And I just want to make sure that everybody knows that the Burlington Electric Commission, we meet. It's a great forum for people to bring questions, to offer input and advice. I know there's been a lot of meetings at the two, but I would invite um, folks that are interested in discussing district energy in the McNeil plant to come to the commission as well. Um, and I just want you all to know that the commission meet, you know, we're talking about this issue. Um, and just also to remind folks that BED's primary mission is to provide reliable, affordable electricity to the ratepayers in the city of Burlington. Net Zero Energy is also a critical part of BED's mission and goals. And the McNeil plant and the District Energy Plan are fundamental parts of BED's strategy to provide reliable, affordable energy and advance the Net Zero Energy goals. Um, there are negative impacts associated with all energy production. BED is working towards transitioning away from the most harmful and the most carbon intensive forms of energy as it moves towards cleaner and more renewable sources. The McNeil plant is part of this solution. It allows us to increase um, energy production when we need to and it also can um, back away from it as needed and the district energy proposal would increase the efficiency of energy production overall. So I just wanted to let you know that we are taking that issue under consideration. I know there's been a lot of advocates that have come and voiced, voiced um, opposition to McNeil and to the district energy and I would invite them to come to the commission and talk to, about it with us there and just to let you all know that we are debating and discussing those issues. Thank you, thanks Bethany. Our next speaker is Jacob Berkowitz to be followed by Lee Morrigan. Good evening. Hello, uh, my name is Jacob and I work in the staffing office at UVMMC. Uh, essentially, my job is to staff the hospital, uh, namely the inpatient nursing units uh, from a pool of resource staff. Uh, in my three years at UVMMC, I faced a number of challenges, uh, the most significant of which is the complete lack of support staff. Uh, today, for instance, the inpatient nursing units were down around 42% of their floor LNAs. In other words, it was a very unsafe day at UVMMC. Uh, days and nights like these are increasingly common, and I publicly shared my office's data with both the administration and recently on Councillor Bergman's monthly broadcast. Uh, one of the chief reasons for this increasing deficit is UVMMC's continued refusal to pay a living wage, and they continue to reject our union's common sense proposals that would help retain experienced staff and, God forbid, attract new workers, uh, instead of hiring the often less qualified and less experienced travelers that cost many times more to take care of our patients and the community. And frankly, we're done hearing there isn't enough resources to prioritize the most vulnerable staff that comprise our union, 99% of which qualify for the hospital's own financial assistance program that they offer to patients. Particularly when the administration plans an over $2 billion budget, including the construction of a $130 million outpatient surgery center that they clearly cannot staff, as well as over $46 billion allotted for travelers. Furthermore, we're tired of hearing that there's no money from an organization which, while tens of millions of dollars in the red through a pandemic that saw layoffs, short staffing, and great suffering in the community, decided it was appropriate to often give five and even six-figure bonuses to executives on top of their bloated salaries, with money subsidized by the American taxpayer. These are the battles that we are fighting, and that is why we need your support for this resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lee Morgan, to be followed by Eli Jahan Jahar. I'm, I, anyone whose name is someone whose name is Eli, I believe it's Jahan or Rall. Um, hopefully, that sounds familiar to someone. Um, Lee, good evening. Oh, do you not have the mic on? Is, is it? Oh, you didn't hear it. Can I start over? Of course. Thanks. <laughs> you can start over. All right. Typically, I'm loud enough without a mic, but. 
All right, so my name is Lee Morgan. I'm a resident of Ward 7. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I'm here to talk to you tonight about the REIB audit and report. I think it's really important to note that Director Green was not an employee for a lot of the timeline of this audit. And Ms. Ellerby uh, was an employee, not a director. Um, and I feel shouldn't be held to the same weight and responsibility as a director. Um, the report was really confusing to me, and for me, uh, definitely generated a lot more questions than answers. I found the uh, conclusion portion to be completely contradictory with the recommendations. Uh, for example, in the conclusion, conclusion section, it alleges uh, misconduct and carelessness, while then in the recommendation section makes it very clear that no law or city policy was violated. I don't understand how those two can coexist. Um, so referenced was uh, hotel stays and uh, in-state and out-of-state contractors being registered with the state. Uh, there's no policy about these things, so I. I don't understand how there's carelessness and mismanagement about that. In fact, one of the issues highlighted the most in the media, the hiring of a, uh, of a, a former college roommate of Director Green's, uh, which does not violate the current policy of conflict of interest, which is limited to familial and personal financial interests, even with the suggested new policy suggested in recommendations, that still would not prevent hiring a former college roommate. It would simply put that information in front of the Board of Finance. So for me, if there's any carelessness in this management, I feel that that falls to the management of the city. This report is incomplete, contradictory, and misleading, and I hope there are some steps taken tonight to start to correct this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our, ne our next speaker is Eli Jahaner Rell. Does that sound? Yes. To be followed by Jake Schumann. I'm a little bit crippled. Take your time. Is this thing on? Is the speaker on? The speaker is on. Just get close to the microphone if you can. I am Eli Yohanovich, uh, 83 years old, uh, have a degree in mathematics. Uh, Two years in Vermont State uh, in, in medical school, uh, sixth in my class. Uh, made good money all my life. I bought a 1958 Chevrolet and Pallet convertible and, uh, for $3,600. And now I can't even afford to live. I live on the street. I've been on the street for six years, I mean for six months. And I'm tired. Uh, I need a place to present a world peace speech. I was anointed by God in 1977 to, as a prophet, and I need a place to speak, and that's why I'm here uh, to attempt to get this. The last two verses of Malachi in the Old Testament said, I have seen you Elijah the prophet, and he will turn the fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I smite the land with a curse. In Revelations 11, 3, 11, 3, it says, I will grant my two witnesses power to speak. Uh, these two powers are me as to speak, and God and Mother Earth, which is the ground, uh, to support me. Judgment Day uh, will begin at the day that I began speaking. This was again anointed. 99.9% .9 of the world population will fall dead. Uh, this is biblical. 
And because they fail to do two things, uh, you must love all people, even those who do dastardly things, because our culture produced all of these. No one was produced. Uh, the other thing is have respect for all races and people. Uh, black, you know, respect them. Respect them. Uh, I need a platform to present this speech with. The, with thank, thank you so much. Is that it? Yes, thank you. Anyway, thank you. Our next speaker is Jake Schumann to be followed by uh, Grace File. Good evening, Jake. Hello. Is this on? You have that on? Microphone's on? I believe it's on. Great. Okay, my name is Jake Schumann. <clears throat> I am here, um, I don't know that I have much to offer um, that hasn't already been said. I would just like to lend my voice in support of my community members who are here uh, tonight. I support BIPOC women, I support unions. I think both of those things are good and we need to support uh, our people in our community. I would like to yield the remainder of my time. I know this is not how it works here, but if somebody would like to go over and is Part of those communities, I'd love to offer them my minute and a half. Finally, Moreau's got to go. It's time. Hey. The writing's on the wall. Jake. <laughs> so our, ne our next speaker is uh, Grace File to be followed by Fareed. Good evening. Hello. Um, I'm here today in solidarity with Taisha and with Farine and with all of the black women and non-binary folks and femmes in our state who are repeatedly facing terrorism and racism every single day. And if you think that for some reason, because you have this position of power, because you're a good white person, you put one of those signs outside of your house, that you're somehow exempt from racism and white supremacy, you're wrong. And the fact that you're not doing everything that you can in your power to center the safety and the joy and the sense of belonging of black folks and brown folks in our community is a huge disservice and shows that you're not qualified to run our city. There is a world in which people of color can feel like they belong here and can feel safe and that's a world that a lot of us are fighting for and advocating for. That can happen if we all work together to end white supremacy, the white supremacy that lives in ourselves and in our family members and in our community. And because you are not doing that, members of this council, some of you, that shows that you're not qualified to represent us. If you're not committed to the safety and well-being and belonging of everyone in our community, you're not qualified to be here. <laughs> As you look at this beautiful banner up here, I hope everyone gets a chance to look at it. It's really lovely, this quilt that says Juneteenth 2021 on it. I hope you think about how this all could have gone differently how black and brown folks who work in our city government, who work with you all, could feel supported and taken care of, and how this beautiful, wonderful event could have been celebrated and lauded and could have set the tone for the rest of this existence as a city. We could continue to have these beautiful celebrations, but because of what you have done unnecessarily, it's wrong, it's ridiculous, and you should resign. Thank you. Uh, Fareed, good evening. And our next speaker uh, following Fareed is Todd LaCroix to be followed by Brian Sheena. Good evening. I uh, almost got investigated by Chairman Tower, uh, by Director Green, when uh, the People's Kitchen applied for a grant. Uh, there was some misunderstanding, um, and one of our colleagues, Lydia Diamond, called asking about the status. Um, they said Green was right. Um, right there, like wanting to make sure, like there was nothing going on that wasn't uh, that wasn't legal. She was honestly, although it scared me at the time, it showed me that uh, she is a woman of very high integrity. 
Uh, and as we uh, were contracted to also feed people for the Juneteenth, uh, the city departments made it really hard for us to access the resources that we needed. And a call to Taisha Green made sure that was all taken care of. Um, I do think investigation is a good thing. I think there should be an office of investigation for residents to put complaints about uh, city departments that aren't really doing their job, such as the Office uh, of Code Enforcement. There's too many tenants who's, be, who's been made homeless. Uh, as you're aware, one of my, our colleagues was recently made homeless because a landlord neglected to update their fire uh, detection system. So this happens way too many times. There should also be, since UVM received a uh, pilot at uh, the pay payment in lieu of taxes, they should be under the city's uh, livable wage ordinance and any violation of that should be investigated. So uh, please consider, as, as, as the, the conversation around police discipline is stalling, consider an independent office of investigation like the New York City's Ombudsman Service, where we residents can talk to somebody who is held accountable by us to investigate all the wrongdoings that's being done by the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Todd LaCroix to be followed by Brian Sheena. There's so much hypocrisy going around in America, I can't even stand it. There's hypocrisy every which way we look. I see so much selective outrage every which way from people like you and people like you. I see people being hypocrites. How many times have you called somebody an anti-Semite because they called you out for being corrupt? Now you're experiencing something similar. Black people and everybody in America do the same thing. They do. I'm married to a black woman, and my divorce was a nightmare in this America because I had to deal with black supremacy and white supremacy. You see how vehement it gets when you even want to talk about the problems, right? And ah, ah, but nobody wants to call out the facts that all of the people almost in the last few years that have threatened me. You see, now, you see, now they want to stop me up. Two minutes, you see how violent this is. I cannot even get through my statement because I'm getting assaulted for calling people out for the same hypocrisy. President Paul, can I call This is recess? a violation. I don't see the police officer stopping her from assaulting me because the police are also assaulting me. And I don't see any black people caring about my assaults. No, Right, I've been told that for years. I started Occupy Wall Street. And I got assaulted during Black Lives Matter in the last few years. I got treated like shit. I married a black woman, and my children are half black. And this is a disgrace what we become in this country. The division, the hypocrisy. Yeah, you see the terrorists that you
next person who is speaking is Brian Sheeta. Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame. When you are blue in the side of oppression, you are anti-black. Recess. I need to take care of a couple of things. Um, Brian, if you want to just sit there or or, if, or not, that's fine. We need a. Let's Deborah. take Representative Brian Cheney. So call it. Why don't you let me go and take Rep it? Representative Cheney, I'll be back in five minutes. We're going to have a five minute recess. Uh, our next speaker is uh, State Representative Brian Cheney. Brian, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Thank you. Um, I'm not just a state representative, I'm also a social worker, and I, I've never seen as much suffering as I've seen in the world right now, and tonight's evidence of that. 
Um, and I've studied all religions of the world. I believe they all have something to offer us. And in Buddhism, one of the four noble truths is that existence is suffering. And something I talk about with my clients is why do we make it harder for ourselves and others? And, why, and I ask you, why have we built a government that harms the very people that we're supposed to serve? We've created a carceral state that uses violence of the state against the people to enforce social control. And after many years of trying to end systemic racism, we make, made great strides, but now we're seeing the backlash as white men can't handle when black women are better than them. And this audit, I feel, is being used as an instrument of state violence. And I ask, you know, if we're gonna talk about mismanagement, whatever happened to the mismanagement of the TIF district after years of critique of previous administrations? Um, whatever happened to that? We should be talking about that. And uh, this pattern of state violence fits into a pattern I've seen as people were evicted from Sears Lane to make way for a luxury neighborhood when hundreds of people are sleeping in the woods now. Um, and we've seen the abuse of young black men and their trauma intensified so that they can be used as scapegoats. We've seen attempts to cover up investigation of police homicide. We've seen healthcare workers intimidated by the police. And then the hospital administration being complicit with the harm of the carceral state. And, and so I just wanna say violence begets violence. That's something that's in the Bible. That's something Martin Luther King said. And it also has been said that only love can conquer hate. And so I just wanna say to everyone, in the face of so much hate, don't let anyone take away our love for each other. So I'll just end on that note. And I, I'm here in solidarity with the black women, the strong black femmes, and also with the union at UVM. Thank you. Thank you. So we have, we have no other speakers who are in Conchois who are Burlington residents. We have a number. Okay, you may, uh, you know, I apologize. I'm, what is, I'm sorry, what is your name? Okay, you just didn't have an address. So I didn't know. Please come, of course. Um, All right, uh, before I begin, uh, Karen, congrats on the president, and, you know, uh, but if you interrupt me tonight or any other black person, you are anti-black, so, but if you still decide to interrupt me, just address my braid, not me, thank you. Okay, uh, first up, hi, Miami, watching at home, love you. Um, and for the first 15 seconds, I just want to say, uh, you got the right day, but the wrong nigga. Um, in 1915, during the Reconstruction era, there was a film called Birth of a Nation. And the plot, just I'll just summarize it, it includes a white knight on a horse, Miro, um, saving the white woman in distress, Burlington. And it frames black people, specifically black masculine people, Taisha as either incompetent, a super predator, or a monster. So with this auditing, you tried, you, Miro, you tried to use the stalish trope, one of the stalish trope, I'm bored actually, to call a brilliant, beautiful, talented, gifted, black queen incompetent. Fuck off. All right, and Champlain College, when I was, 19 years old, during my second year at Champlain College, I was involved in a Title IX investigation. That resulted from two kisses on the cheek, I didn't get no pussy, but I got called a rapist. So that is one of the tropes, right? I am a super predator. And now in 2023, it has resurfaced, right? So I was the victim of institutional racism. So my heart goes out to not only Taisha, but the countless black films, black people, black masculine bodied people who are continuously targeted by Mira Weinberger and countless other white supremacist motherfuckers. So, Miro, white knight, yoo Get off your horse. Do not think that for a second that you will continue your reign of bullshit whiteness. Get off your horse. Um, and I got one more thing. 
And uh, revolution is not a one-time event. So black people always got black people's back. I'm not really talking to black people right now, but for you white abolitionists, accomplices, and co-conspirators, I'm not talking to allies, I'm talking to those people, show up again. Revolution is not a one-time event. Word to Audre Lorde. Shit, maybe show up tomorrow. And in conclusion, Miro, you about to lose your job. You about to lose your job. Get this dance. You about to lose your, I'm sorry, I got, I'm gonna wrap that up, I got it. Okay, bye. So of those people who have requested to speak um, in ConChoice, I, I've, I've looked, I, I believe all of you have addresses that are outside Burlington. If there aren't, if there are any of you that have submitted a form and you are Burlington residents, um, please just raise your hand and, to, and then we, or we will go to um, those who are joining us online. Do you have, okay, well, you are, I understood, understood. We will, we, will, we, will get, we will get to all non-Burlington residents after we go to Burlington residents who are joining us online. So we'll have a, we'll have a timer set up for, we'll have a timer set up. Yes, great. So the first person who is joining us online who is a Burlington resident is um, Ryan Bergman. And um, Ryan, I have found you and enabled your microphone. I'm not sure if you wish to speak now or if you wanted to speak when the agenda item comes up for the Church Street Marketplace. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Did you want to speak now or did you want to wait until later in the agenda? Yeah, whatever you guys think is best. Was that a yes or no? I, I, you, you'd prefer to I, wait? I, I'm happy to speak now. I'm happy to wait. It really doesn't matter to me whatever you guys think would be best for this meeting at this point in time. Um, well, what we normally do when we get to the agenda item for any commission appointments is we give any of the candidates who are present the opportunity to speak, and you can do so at that time, or if you're pressed for time, you could certainly speak now. Okay, I might as well just speak now in the... Uh, in the um, Okay, yeah, go ahead. Of time. So just, I wanted to express my interest in the vacant seat on the Church Street Marketplace, com Marketplace Commission as they could bring a unique fund of professional and personal qualifications to this role. Professionally, I'm a seasoned financial expert with a strong background in risk management, budgeting, and strategic planning. I work for two Fortune 500 companies in San Francisco and currently at Silver Lake Wealth Management in Wilson, Vermont. On a personal level, I'm a Burlington native and resident of the Old North End, living two blocks away from Church Street with my wife and three-year-old son. I'm not just an observer, but a stakeholder in the vitality of the marketplace, frequenting its shops and dining at its restaurants with my family regularly. This intimate connection provides me with unique insights and perspectives. If I'm appointed, my primary goal will be to promote the long-term financial stability, safety, and growth of the marketplace, preserve its unique identity, and foster a thriving, diverse business community. I am passionate about improving visitor amenities, public safety, and promoting sustainable practices. I believe my professional experience, personal connection to Burlington, and commitment to the community make me a strong candidate for this role, and I would be honored to serve my community in this capacity. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, our next speaker is Carla Shea Sh Sh Salazar, and Carla, I do not see you online. I don't know if you're calling in to, um, are participating under another name. Um, if you are and want to use the raise hand function, I will come back to you. Um, the next person from Burlington who wishes to speak is um, Sarah Schiortino. And Sarah, I believe this may be you. Sarah, is that you? I've enabled a microphone with Sarah S. Yes, this is me. Great, thanks. Please go ahead. Um, hey, my name is Sarah Shortino. I live in Ward 5, and I'm calling in to speak out in solidarity with Taisha Green and other Black Femmes in Burlington. I also wanted to echo the voices of the UVM MC union members today. Um, as we all are well aware, I would hope, <laughs> Taisha has done so much work to strengthen community in Burlington and cultivate spaces that 
our city has in large part otherwise seriously failed to. Since Taisha has been pushed out of the city as a result of blatant failures to support or even display basic respect for her work, um, the on-the-clock conduct of multiple city officials has been brought into question. The city has not done their due diligence by conducting investigations in regards to these instances, and um, one of them even got a pretty significant promotion. And despite egregious and unethical behavior, including an almost unbelievable threat made to a surgeon on the job responding to crisis, John Murad moved up the ranks through a flawed process and was supported by eight of the counselors before us in doing so. I hope that you will, in this case, support Black Femmes who have done so much for the community that you've been elected to serve. And I really love Burlington and I love living here. Um, but, and I really hate to say it, it really makes me sad to say this, but I feel ashamed in a lot of ways for living here in light of this situation. Um, and I hope that we can do a better job of not forcing folks out of the city who go against the racist status quo. And I hope that clarity can come to those willing to allow this audit process to perpetuate systemic racism and make Burlington a less welcoming place. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Robert O. Moore. And um, Robert, I don't see you online. Again, if, if you are under another name and want to use the raise hand function, I will try to find you in that way. Uh, our next person joining us, a Burlington resident joining us online to speak is Pike Porter. And Pike, I have found you and enabled your microphone. You should be able to speak now. Yes, hi, thanks for uh, taking my call. Sure. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Uh, earlier today, I sent the city council uh, several documents, which you may, you should already have had, um, but I wanted to bring them to the top of your attention, um, given that you're now in discussions with VTang again over something that we don't know yet what that is about. Um, I also sent an email indicating that um, the Air Force is one of the richest entities in the world um, with a, a budget in 2023 of over $2 billion. And you're leasing 280 acres of prime real estate for a dollar. Um, given the, all the attention um, that the mayor has paid to the REIB um, office and the Juneteenth uh, contracts, I would hope that the city council also scrutinizes their agreements with VTANG um, and considers really the harm that um, the continued operations of the F-35s are doing to thousands of people uh, in the region and the, the cost uh, to the, the regional economy, the local economy uh, in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pike. Our next speaker joining us online is uh, Ishmael Ahmed, and I believe I did, um, and I did see, I did see you early. Oh, yes, great. You've raised your hand. Um, I. You should be able to speak now if you just unmute yourself on your end. So I take it you can hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. So my name is Ishmael Ahmed. Um, I grew up in Underhill. I came out of MMU in 1990. And I lived in Burlington for almost 30 years now. My mother and my six children live here with five of them in the school district from high school to elementary school. Um, I come to stand in solidarity not only with Taisha but with also the uh, the, uh, the medical center workers. Um, what I want to speak to specifically is how spending priorities are decided and what's considered acceptable exp expenditures. Um, focusing on the lowest cost vendor, I think, well, it points, basically helps enable systems as they currently are, which are most of the time exploitative and come out of a place of white supremacy. And we also need to remember the history of eugenics within Vermont. There is a reason that Abnaki people look the way they do. 
So when we make our decisions of spending money and resources to support our community, which is essentially your job, you need to make sure that we are including what we wish to see in our future. For example, let's say there was a desire to celebrate Latino music. Choosing a DJ, for example, I would say would make sense to consider one that comes out of the tradition and out of that place that might cost 30 to 50% more than someone who doesn't, but still can spin salsa, you know, merengue, whatever. So I would ask the, uh, the city council to really take a look at the bylaws around how spending decisions are made as they have a very wide and far-reaching impact, right? Because part of this audit was about how the money was spent. The idea that possibly there's vendors that cost more than others that were chosen. There's reasons for that, and I think they're valid. Anyways, thank you all very much. Um, I hope I, uh, I was able to make myself clear, and um, have a good night. Great, thank you so much. Our next speaker joining us online is Julia Curry. And Julia, Julia I see you um, and have enabled your microphone. You should be able to speak if you unmute yourself on your end. Thank you. I am glad to see so many of my fellow Burlingtonians um, coming out this evening and speaking this evening. I have to echo Sarah's comment that I really feel ashamed of our city at this moment, and that isn't something I often feel you know we're all flawed we all make mistakes but the decision to commission this reib report investigation was just kind of astonishing to me an astonishing lapse of judgment and ironically a real failure of integrity so i want to raise up the that leadership and integrity involves self-awareness, it involves self-reflection, it involves humility and the willingness to learn. Whereas what I see in the commissioning of this report is a kind of defensive or vindictive desire to, to basically attack someone who is no longer in a position to defend herself a complete waste of scarce resources we certainly cannot afford to be using in this personalistic way. It's a kind of um, projection of ego that really doesn't belong in strong leadership with integrity. It really makes me sad. It makes me sad for everyone in the city, in particular for all the Black femmes and non-binary people who, you know, in, who experience attacks and targets daily and, and now have to experience that, that, you know, the highest levels of our city are complicit in that. And I hope that everyone who had a role in making this decision will actually search their hearts for how they came to do that and learn how to not do it again. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple of people that are joining us online that are not Burlington residents. We will come back to them. Um, now we'll return to Contois for those joining us in person who are non-Burlington residents. The first is Kathleen Kemp to be followed by Kaya Morris. Good evening, Karen. Good evening. I'm Kathleen Kemp from Winooski. I spent many years living in Burlington. And I am clearly and obviously here in support of Taisha Green, Casey Ellerby, and everyone else in my greater circle. What I want to do is tell a short story. The terrorism on black bodies in this state was made clear to me 50 years ago when I had to endure Slave Day 
at Burlington High School. I protested. I said, guidance counselor, all the people that I had relationships with, why are we doing this? Oh, we're just having fun. Get over it. Three years in a row, didn't change. Kept happening. The auction was one day, and then all the fun happened the next day. So I watched my fellow students in chains, on leashes, being fools in the hallways that I had to walk by while I was there for an education. Okay, so the terrorizing has happened for years, and that was my welcome to Vermont, now go home moment. fascinating that the camera is right there so you can't look at the mayor. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. My name is Kaya Morris and I'm a resident of Essex Junction. In solidarity with Ty, I'm here today in solidarity with Taisha Green, Casey Ellerby, black femmes, non-binary and trans women throughout Vermont who have or are currently experiencing racial and gender-based discrimination, harassment, displacement, and terrorism. I'm here because Taisha and Casey's stories are of my own and of so many people who live, work, and play in Vermont. I am here because the abuse of political power or the lack of political courage by leaders in addressing the racism and deeply entrenched practices of white supremacy and structural racism that have made far too many black femmes, non-binary folks, gender non-conforming and trans individuals have to leave this state. Countless of us must choose the safety of their families, job security and community over fighting back, speaking out and challenging the harmful practices which negatively impact us all. And in the 15 years that I've lived here in Vermont, nearly every job that I've had has had similar threads. Hire the black woman, demand more work than what she's compensated for, downplay or usurp her accomplishments, defame her character, and push her out. The harm continues with the economic devastation that comes from this displacement, from the abuse that causes mental and physical distress to her and her family, the loss of another voice and their irreplaceable contributions to this state. Burlington, Juneteenth, 2021 and 2022 were some of the most triumphant days that I've had since calling Vermont my home. It is foul to cast dispersions on the events and the transformative work that was helmed by former Director Green. Now, Vermont has long struggled to live up to its values, and in this moment, Mayor Weinberger and his administration are proving how dangerous, unchecked misogynoir and bias can be to the lives and livelihoods of black women and femmes in Vermont. I appreciate one more moment as some folks did yield their time. I just wanna make sure that the final demand that was the most important is that we want a full public articulation of harm from Mayor Mira Weinberger and the city of Burlington. To Taisha Green, to Casey Ellerby, to their families for the continued defamation of character and unwarranted actions taken through the city processes like this audit. Not an apology, a reckoning and accounting for the multiple forms of harm enacted by the city on behalf of the residents. Yes, each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next. Our next speaker, our next speaker is Lydia Diamond, to be followed by Leah Briggs. Did you say my name? Yes, I did. Can you hear me? Can yes, you hear me can. now? Yep. 
My name is Lydia Diamond, and I used to live in Burlington. Now I'm in South Burlington. I had a glorious time this year running for South Burlington City Council. Why did you run, Lydia? They asked. And I said, because no person of color has ever stepped up to do it. So here I am. Guess what? I'm running again. <laughs> but I want y'all to know, I came out today in support of these beautiful black women behind me because y'all got us all fucked up. And you fuck with one, you fucking with all of us. And we don't play that shit. I'm from the gutters of Brooklyn, New York. And I came to Vermont in 94. My mama brought me here. She wanted me to live. See my shirt? I, I, oh I brought my ancestors with me. Because I have worked uh, for my rep at the Burlington Free Press. But he was a big, beautiful, blonde woman named Jennifer Johnson. And she loved to ride Lydia. And I was discriminated against. So when, even though I, I don't know Taistia personally, I do know she a black woman. So I know exactly what, I know exactly what she went through. Did you cut me off? Oh, I know exactly what she went through. And it's been going on for far too long. I came to let y'all know that the domestic violence against women of color has to stop. It has to stop. Enough is enough. We don't want to fight. We want to be respected as human beings. First. First, human beings. Thank you. Thank you. We deserve to breathe. We deserve to support our families. We deserve everything that you get. I'm entitled you. to it too. Thank you so much. You, are you trying to shut me down? I'm telling you that your time is up. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'll be back. Okay. You have not seen the last of me. So before we, get, before we get to the next speaker, just wanted to alert the council that we have gone over our time for public forum, and so we just simply need to take a vote on whether or not to extend public forum. Um, uh, Councilor McGee, I assume that you are joint, you are, you're able to hear us? Yes, yes. okay, great, thank you. Um, just, so, just so everyone is aware, there are about 11 people that are left to speak. Um, so a motion, uh, Councilor Hightower. Move to extend the public forum. Thank you. A second to that motion. Seconded by Councilor Berkman. All those in favor of extending the public forum uh, until our last speaker has been heard, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, aye. please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor McGee. Any opposed, please say no. No. Uh, that, that motion. That, Ooh, that, true to form. Hey, hey, hey. Let, 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 us, let, let, us, let us conduct our business. Um, that motion passes um, by a vote of um, 10 to 1. Um, so we will continue with our public forum. Our next speaker is Leah Briggs to be followed by Gina Rest. Point of Point of information. I think it yes. might have been nine to one. No. Well, there are twelve. 
Nine. Nine to one. You're right. My apologies, I can't count. Nine to one. Good evening. Hello. My name is Leah Briggs. I've been with the University of Vermont Medical Center for 22 years and consider my fellow coworkers my family. I've had the privilege to work with an incredible team of phlebotomists, also known as vampires, bloodsuckers, or oh no, you're here again. <laughs> I am here today to plead for your support and better working conditions for all of our essential support workers at UVM Medical Center. My experience lies with phlebotomy and I would like to share a little about them. Our team of phlebotomists work under extremely stressful situations with minimal staffing and staggering responsibilities. More than 80% of diagnosis and treatment is based on laboratory tests. Last quarter, from April 1st to June 30th, my team of 45 phlebotomists collected over 50,000 patients. That's on average around 580 per day with an error rate of under 1%. All this with critically low staffing, we provide a hand to hold through trauma, a shoulder for patients' tears, a calming voice in moments of fear, and a passion for all of it. This is why it breaks my heart that UVM phlebotomists or UVMMC phlebotomists are paid only $16.63 an hour. This is how UVMMC values your health care. 80% of what your provider does is based on the performance of someone that is getting paid less than my 17-year-old daughter gets paid at McDonald's. On your website, the city of Burlington, the low income limit is $63,600 per year. A UVMMC phlebotomist grosses $35,000 a year. How is it okay that that's acceptable? How is it okay for the largest employer in the state and the only level one trauma center in the region to undervalue their staff to the point of extreme poverty? UVMMC is creating and maintaining a class of working poor in the state of Vermont. This is not okay. I understand I have one more sentence. We need your help and your support in changing the way UVMMC values their most precious resource, which is all of our support staff. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So our next, our next speaker is uh, Gina Ress, to be followed by Alex Hilliard. Hi, everyone. My name is Gina Ress. I work at UVM, as well as you can see all of our red shirts. And I do support you guys on the other side. Um, I kind of want to just follow up with what Leah said, that we have, we need to be paid for the work that we do. We can't afford to live here, and we're taking care of both sides of the community. We can't do that if we don't get paid. People are leaving. P good people are leaving this hospital as a result of us not getting paid or being able to fully have the ability to have downtime. In other words, be able to decompress. We need to be able to do that. And if we can't do that, it's not going to help our community on either side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next, our next speaker is Alex Hilliard to be followed by Tara uh, Gregg. Hi, Alex. Hi, my name is Alex Hilliard. I'm a black and a, I am a black and trans individual from Poultney, a town 60 miles to the south in Rutland County. I wanted to use this opportunity as a teaching moment for my two children with me today to teach them what it means to show up for black women. We have come to protest the unjust, unsubstantiated investigation of former DIB director, Taisha Green. At the hands of employees, the media, and states and local government offices, scores of black women and non-binary individuals have experienced abusive practices and disproportionate harm. The abusive practices include gaslighting, turning a blind eye to hate crimes occurring in the greater community, and ignoring the daily racial microaggressions these women face. Those women and non-binary folks unsurprisingly flee their elected public offices, senior management roles, and executive officer positions when the back-breaking burden becomes too much to bear. Enough is enough. It's time for Vermont to show up for black women. Not one more black woman. Not Taisha Green or Kathleen Kemp 
or Kaya Morris, or Farine Paris Meyer, or Zariah Hightower, or any of the black women or black non-binary folks you know, because most people in this room know someone who is who identifies that way and has been adversely impacted by racism. It's time to do the right thing, and that begins with apologies to Taisha Green and Casey Ellerby. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next, uh, our next speaker is Tara Gregg, to be followed by Eric Weinman. Tara? I'm sorry, what? I came here for the union, I support this union, but we need to hear more of this. And I'm here to tell you that one of us, I've called my senator. I've called my senator, and that stupid song came out, and I started seeing I'm an eighth generation Vermonter small town, saying that somebody is going to get killed in this community. I know this woman from a movie that is internationally famous for you being racist and writing slurs on our home. I'm wearing this tape on my mouth because if you haven't seen the movie yet, this is what it looks like, okay? It's called Misogyny in the Digital Age. It's an international film about racism in Vermont and one of the victims is sitting right there. I suggest you all watch it. If I die or get killed by any of your crazy small town yokels, I'll know where it came from. But I still yield my time and let them finish. So our next, our next speaker is Eric Weinman to be followed by Muhuddin Bata. Good evening. How are you? My name is Eric Weinman. I've been employed here at U UVMMC in the phlebotomy department since December of 2022. I absolutely love my position as a phlebotomist. I suffer from hemophilia A, a rare chronic bleeding illness. I have to administer intravenous medicine three times a week. So I am able to connect with patients that struggle with blood draws because I know how difficult it can be from my own experience. Having the opportunity to assure an anxious patient that they are in good hands is truly a rewarding and gratifying experience. I do believe it takes a special person to work in healthcare, and the team I am blessed to be a part of goes above and beyond to ensure that we deliver the finest patient care possible. My coworkers that helped guide and mentor me are incredible phlebotomists that continue to share their knowledge and experience with other new hires so that we can continue to serve our patients and community that require blood work. Our patients depend on us to safely draw and handle their samples so that they can receive the results they so desperately need. I'm a parent to a brave, intelligent, and hardworking 17-year-old son. I have an amazing fiance who supports me in every aspect of my life. She supported me when I made the decision to leave my comfortable, well-paying career for a $16.36 hourly wage with questionable, questionable benefits. With my current wage, I am eligible for government assistance. With my current wage, I would not be able to afford my apartment without the aid of my fiance's salary. With my current wage, I would not be able to support myself or my son in the state of Vermont. I would never tell my son Lucas, but he is paid a higher wage than his 40-year-old father. My current wage is $16.36. My son, Lucas, is making 18 hours at McDonald's. This is unacceptable for the largest healthcare provider in the state of Vermont. It is disgusting. Our next... So our next speaker is Muyadeen Bata. My apologies if I've mispronounced your name. I'll fix it. I'll fix it. How, how do you pronounce it? Uh, my name is Muyadeen Bata. I'm Palestinian American. I've uh, been in, living in Vermont for 23 years. Uh, uh, 
what happened, what, what's happened in, 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 in Burlington, what happened here now, remind me of what happened two years ago when we were suppressed about the BDS, and this is exactly what's happening, we're being suppressed here. Uh, uh, I feel like minorities are being all, all the time oppressed and suppressed in this country, and there's no difference between here and Israel. I feel like I didn't even leave uh, Israel. Uh, I feel I, I still live under uh, uh, racism in this, in this uh, country because of my the minority. Uh, I'm here to uh, it, it, it doesn't look to me like anything changed here. Uh, you haven't changed at all. Uh, 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 and that's why he have to keep coming here and uh, back uh, and uh, talk to you and demand that you change all of your policies uh, against minorities. And uh, uh, two years ago when the, we went kind of be vote for, voting for BDS against the Israeli brutal occupation, we were accused of being anti-Semitic, which is bullshit. There's nothing anti-Semitic against Israeli brutal occupation. And the mayor, and he wrote also against it. He said it, it, BDS is anti-Semitic, which is crap and bullshit. That's not right. The same thing is happening uh, against blacks and minorities in, in here, and nothing is changing. It looks like it. This is, this is unacceptable at all. And I think you should ship up and really think to your, into your hearts and think about other people and other people oppressed and suppressed. That's, that's, that's all I can say. I'm really just, I'm so pissed at the policies of this place here. Thank you. <laughs> so our, our, last, our last speaker that is joining us in Contois is Tabitha Moore. Hi. Hi. Can we start just with a deep breath? I don't know if anyone else needs that. I know I do. Um, so as you said, my name is Tabitha Moore. I'm a sixth generation Vermonter, founding president of the Rutland area branch of the NAACP and former state director of the Vermont branches of the NAACP, current chair of the criminal justice committee for the Rutland area branch. Even though I live up here, they let me do a little stuff on the side. Not a lot of people of color want to be meddling in law enforcement these days. And um, well, before I get, I wasn't planning on coming down or talking. I'm currently battling Lyme disease and I'm in the last part of my dissertation. But when I saw what was happening, I knew that I had to come and more fully support the women of color. Um, and I just want you to know that uh, though Presidents Gillum and Schultz of the, of the Vermont branches of the NAACP can't be here tonight, they want everyone to know that they will be following up and they will be in support of Taisha and be watching this process uh, with great interest because this is not a new story. Since 1909, the NAACP has been dealing with this and there's a reason we keep coming back. There's a reason we keep showing up at the table and it's because we keep screwing it up. But before I get there, counselors of color on this board right now, wow, I see you. I see you and I see what you're going through and I know what you're gonna have to do tonight and I am so sorry, but I'm glad you're there. So it doesn't surprise me that we're still here and we're still having this conversation and what a beautiful, horrible moment that we have people fighting for fair wages and we have people fighting for fair processes in general because it's our systems that continue to squeeze us till we have nothing left that keep us from prosperity, that keep us from living, that keep us from harm like what Taisha is getting even since that terrible headline ran in, what was it? Which one was it was the terrible one? It was Digger. Immediately Taisha is getting death threats. Be aware of what you do, and this doesn't have to be hard, but it does require humility. Thank you. So, so we have four people left in the queue that are joining us online, so we'll go and put the timer up for those, um, for those remaining people who have asked to speak during public forum. The first person is uh, Sandy Bermanzone, and 
Sandy, I have found you and enabled your microphone. You should be able to speak. If you just unmute yourself on your side. Sandy? So I can come back to you, Sandy. Um, the next person is Heather Bowman. And Heather, I've enabled your microphone. You should be able to speak as well. Good evening. My name is Heather Bauman. I work at UVMMC as a phlebotomist, and I'm a proud member of our community's newest union, the Support Staff United. I came to my work at the Medical Center as a way to connect with and contribute to our community as we emerge from this overwhelming medical crisis that is the COVID pandemic acknowledging the needs of others um, struck me as an obligation and finding a way to offer support seems uh, like everyone's responsibility. So we at UVMMC and the support staff do this work um, despite the fact that we are being paid significantly below a livable wage. And despite the fact that we're short staffed to the point where we're unable to perform our roles in patient care in a timely safe manner and where we regularly experience violence at work. Because the base wages at UVMMC support staff are so low, many of us in our union qualify for income-based state and federal assistance. And many of us are on Medicaid, and most of us qualify uh, for insurance through the state exchange. Very few of us can afford the health insurance that UVMMC offers us as a air quote benefit. The regressive system that they have in place where the least of us are expected to pay the same as the, those who are paid the most, put us in the untenable position of working diligently all day long to provide health care to our community, but yet we are unable to provide our families with the spoils of our labor. Not only are we unable to afford health care, we are actually regularly required by our employer to go into unsafe situations where there is confirmed potential for violence. We are told that it is our responsibility to offer care to all of these patients, regardless of the threat they represent. And we do this. I just wish that UVMMC felt the same obligation to care for their employees as we feel towards our patient and our, our patients and our community. I urge you to vote in support of the resolution, and I hope that we can find ways to make our community safer and healthier for all. Thank you. The, the next person is, um, is um, Myra, I believe it's uh, Flynn. And Myra, I can't find you online. If you want to use the raise hand function, I'm happy to enable your microphone. Um, the last person joining us online is Peter Duval. And Peter, I did see you before. There, Peter. I have, see, I have enabled your microphone. You should be able to speak now. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Good evening from Underhill. I'm Peter Duval and I appreciate Burlington's hybrid public comment procedure. It's the best I've seen in the state. Of course, I'm here to talk about the McNeil generating station and the proposed steam transmission line between McNeil and the hospital. There's a genuine lack of transparency about this project. And I was gonna speak more formally about it, but uh, I think I'll just go right to my request, which is I hope uh, city councilors would uh, take an interest in this project and the details and the lack of documentation of the project. And join me in requesting 
full access to the studies and reports and financial uh, data about the steam transmission line, the project, the project management, and the entities involved in the project. I think this is something that also should interest all employees of UVMMC as the hospital's getting dragged along um, into this project, uh, I think without the full information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, so I'll go back to Sandy Bermanzone. I uh, ha still have enabled your microphone. You just need to unmute on your end. Hello. Oh, great, great. Hi. Hi. My name is Sandy Bermanzon. I live in the town of Shelburne, Vermont, and I'm in here. I'm here in support of Black women and femmes and non-binary people in the state of Vermont. I would like to yield my time, and I'd like to give that time to someone else who has something to say, so that people have more than two minutes to express the kind of things that need to be talked about this evening. Thank you. Thanks very much. So we do have uh, two people that I had called on earlier who I haven't been able to find online. Uh, the first is Carla Shea Salazar. The other is Robert O. Moore. And if you want to just use the raise hand function, I'm happy to enable your microphone. And the last person who just um, signed up for public forum is Susie Comerford. And Susie, I can't find you online. Um, if you want to if you want to use the raise hand function, I'm happy to enable your microphone as well. So again, this is just for Carla Shea Salazar, Robert O. Moore, and Susie Comerford. It does not appear that they are online. So at nine, at eight twenty, we will close the public forum. Um, there are no others that have been at, that have asked to speak in person. Okay. Um, we will close the public forum with our thanks for all the join, uh, all of you who joined us to speak during public forum, and we will go to the rest of our meeting. The next item on our agenda is item number four, which is climate emergency reports. Is there any counselor or the administration who wishes to offer a climate emergency report? Seeing none, we will close out that item and move on to item number five, which is our consent agenda. Is there a motion to move our consent agenda and take the actions as indicated? So moved. Thank you, Councillor Traver, seconded by- Second. Uh, seconded by Councillor Shannon. Um, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to move the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. E any opposed, please say no. Uh, our consent agenda passes unanimously. Um, that will bring us to our deliberative agenda. Uh, there are seven items on our deliberative deliberative agenda and where appropriate there are time limits on each item that we've agreed to by approving our agenda. We'll do our best to keep to those uh, to those time limits. The first item on our agenda is 6.1, which is a communication Mayor Moro Weinberger regarding the appointment of a deputy city attorney. And for this item, I will go to Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, President Paul. I am pleased to be bringing before the council tonight a <clears throat> uh, appointment for the position of deputy city attorney. Um, <clears throat> this is a position that was created um, 
uh, just several years ago, and that uh, is an important position to uh, add to our uh, uh, to add to the way that in which the the meeting is structured. Sorry, I'm just pulling up some notes here on this. So I'm. Um, I'm pleased to be bringing before you Jared Pellerin, who I think is well known to everyone at the council, and he's well known for his good work um, for years now in uh, on some of our most important issues uh, that have been going through the city attorney's office. He is also someone who came to us already with substantial experience, relevant experience, having uh, graduated from Albany Law School and served work as a law clerk in the New York State Assembly. Um, as well as in uh, city government in Albany. Um, he uh, has been a, a huge part of the transition period that we've been in at the city attorney's office. I'm very grateful for his service through an, uh, the extended transition that we've had. Um, and I think this is going to really strengthen the office uh, if the council agrees and confirms him as the deputy city attorney. Um, upon the, that confirmation, we would immediately uh, post the position of his current position, which will um, allow us to expand much needed capacity in the city attorney's office. Thank you, President Paul. Thank you, Mayor and, Weinberger. Um, um, we have, and uh, yes. often it's been customary to, for me to hand it over to uh, Jared, and I was going to do that now. Thank you, Mayor. And I will keep this brief, but um, I appreciate the faith you have in me to carry out this post as deputy city attorney. And I look forward to taking this role if I'm confirmed tonight. I think the city attorney's office does great work. We're all committed to supporting you all in moving Burlington forward. And I think that there is a lot to be done. So I look forward to hitting the ground running tomorrow along with our team and making sure that we see to it that Burlington continues to be a bright spot in Vermont and in the nation. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you uh, also, uh, uh, I guess I, I'm not supposed to say Deputy City Attorney yet, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, uh, for this, we will go to a motion from uh, Councilor Doherty. Yes, thank you, President Paul. I move to confirm the appointment of Mr. Pellerin as Deputy City Attorney for Burlington. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Councillor Berkman. Are there any councillors wishing to speak on this motion before we go to a vote? Seeing none, we will go to that vote. Uh, my apologies. Uh, uh, Councillor Grant. Thank you. Um, I do support this appointment. I want to thank you for our meeting this morning. I felt it was really important. Um, and one of the things we talked about, because I, I do want to make it, it, it's been an ongoing issue, uh, my previous experience on a commission seeking help from the city attorney's office with difficulty with a department head and not getting that help. And then the city's attorney's office saying that they're there for people who are on commissions and committees. So I appreciate um, you listening to me. I actually felt you were listening to me. I appreciated uh, your responses, um, which were more than I've gotten in the past. And I hope that you do put a process in place that will protect people. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Grant. Uh, are there any other counselors wishing to speak to the motion before we go to a vote? Seeing none, all those in favor of the appointment of Jared Pellerin as the deputy city attorney, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, deputy city attorney Pellerin. Thank you all. We will move on to our next item, which is 6.2, a, a tobacco license application 
for Fireman Smoke Shop, LLC. And for that, I'll go to Councillor Shannon. Whoops. Thank you. One second, because I'm in the part that has the links, but not the motion. Sorry for that. It's all right. Um, move to approve the 2023-2024 tobacco license application for Fireman Smoke Shop. Thank you, uh, Councillor Shannon. Seconded by uh, Councillor Grant. Um, are there any, is there any discussion on that motion? Uh, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That motion passes unanimously, which brings us to item 6.3, which is the appointment to the Church Street Marketplace Commission for a term expiring 6-30-2026. And for this item, I'll open the floor to nominations for this commission appointment. Are there any nominations for this commission appointment? Okay Council. Councillor Bergman? Yes, I nominate Romeo von Herman. Thank you. Uh, we don't need a second to that. Um, however, are there any other appointments to the position of Church Street Marketplace Commission for a term expiring 6-30-2026? Seeing none, uh, we will close nominations, or actually I'm supposed to say going once, going twice, we will now close nominations for that position. Um, and there is, one, there is one candidate. All those in favor of the appointment of Romeo von Herman for the position of the Church Street Marketplace Commission, please say aye. 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 Uh, that is unanimous. I believe there are, how many of us actually voting right now? Um, there are 10. Nine without Ben and with, yes, you're correct. Nine, um, that motion passes. Congratulations. <laughs> so we do have a number, we have a number of other commission appointments um, on the agenda for the city council with mayor presiding. So um, we will recess the council meeting at eight Point of information, could we finish this agenda and then go to the other appointments, given the interest in the items at the bottom of our agenda with the general public? Okay. I'll note that item 6.4 has been postponed to our next meeting on September 11th, which brings us um, to item 6.5. I have been asked to be able to take a five minute recess. We will take it at this time and reconvene at 635, uh, I'm sorry, 8.35. We'll reconvene the city council meeting. And the next item on our agenda is item 6.5, which is a resolution support for fair contract for UVMMC support staff Union, um, United Union. And for a motion on this item, I will go to Councilor Bergman. Um, thank you. I'd like to waive the reading of the updated version. Unfortunately, all of my tabs in the, this delay got wiped out, so I can't actually cite it uh, directly, but it was the very last updated version of the, uh, of the um, resolution and ask for a flo uh, the floor back after a, um, for, for some brief comments after a second. Thank you, Councillor Bergman. Uh, seconded by um, Councillor Councilor King. Councillor Bergman, you have the floor. Thank you. Excuse me, uh, President Paul. Well, oh, yes. Uh, just briefly, I have to note my recusal from this matter and pursuant to our practice, we'll step away from the table for this discussion. Mm -hmm. thank, you, thank you, thank you, Councilor Travers. Councilor Doherty? President Paul, I also note my recusal and will also step away. Okay, thank you, Councilor Doherty. Okay. 
we'll wait for just two seconds. Uh, I intend to uh, be brief, but uh, first I just want to thank uh, the union folks who came out, um, who gave incredibly moving testimony, not just tonight, but last time, and who uh, graced me with uh, the opportunity to interview you um, on CCTV. I really appreciate that and the honor that it is that, uh, that for me to, you have to have reached out to me. Um, I also want to thank uh, my fellow city councilors who um, co-sponsored this, um, this resolution. Um, it shows that we can work together for the people's well-being and I truly appreciate um, that work. Um, I'm not gonna read the resolution, uh, given the, the lateness and everything, but it does, I think, speak very clearly about why we as a council need to take the action that is called for in the resolution. But it, um, it, it this is really personal for me um, because it, it uh, recalls the time that I tried to bargain uh, a first contract with the Gannett company that owns uh, the Burlington Free Press when I worked as a production worker there making about six bucks an hour. And um, I remember being at the table and being told um, after we had presented our positions, what does what we, meaning Gannett, make or the what the low wages that you are getting paid have to do with what we, Gannett, are paying you. We pay you what we have to. We pay you what the market dictates. And I'm here to say that this resolution stands up against that logic, against that neoliberalism, against inequality. And I believe that if we pass this resolution unanimously, unanimously it stands for a basic proposition, and that is that a community united for dignity and justice will never be defeated, and that together we can overcome all the obstacles and build a community of fairness and equity for all, and I hope that this council joins me in voting yes on this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for those comments, Councillor Bergman. Uh, the floor is open if there are other councillors who wish to offer questions or comments on the resolution. Uh, Councillor Shannon. Thank you, President Paul. Um, I want to thank all of the union members who have come here at least twice now um, and kind of informed us of what was going on, which I would not have otherwise been aware of after you came at the last meeting and Council Bergman announced at, at, at the council meeting that he was um, planning to put forward a resolution, uh, I asked to be part of that because I really found what you shared with us profoundly concerning as somebody who uses hospital resources more than I would like to, um, has some track marks on my, my arms from some very good phlebotomists. It's stunning that, um, that, that the wages that we are asking you to work for after decades of service in, in some cases are what our local high school graduates are getting for working in a warehouse or McDonald's or, um, you know, it's a real failure to recognize, recognize um, the skills and your tenure in these jobs. So thank you, Councillor Bergman, for bringing this forward. Thank you for um, uh, being willing to work with everybody at the table. I think there, there was a lot of con contributions to how this went forward and including, um, you know, the, the union. I think that we don't want to inflame the situation. Um, we really need, 
we, we are management in our union negotiations and we need to remember that. But uh, it is my hope that the management at the UVM Medical Center um, will come forward and, and recognize the same issues that everybody at this table um, is currently recognizing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Shannon. I'll go to Councillor Hightower and then Councillor McGee, I do see you. We'll go to you next. Um, also just want to thank all of the union members who came and presented both at the last council meeting and at this council meeting. Um, just want to recognize that it takes a lot of courage and a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of emotion um, that's in addition to your jobs um, and that you're doing this not just for yourself but um, for everyone else. Last time when folks spoke, they spoke a lot too. Um, sometimes they were some of the more well-off members so it also requires a lot of empathy to make sure everyone's doing well. So just really appreciate the heart, energy, and time you're putting into this um, to try to make the medical center a better place for everyone. So thank you. Thank you very much, thank you very much, Councillor Hightower. We'll go to Councillor. We'll go to Councillor McGee. Thank you, President Paul. Uh, I also want to echo my thanks to the union members who showed up. Uh, I think we know that uh, the hospital has chronically undervalued workers at every level, and uh, just to see uh, the massive organizing efforts that have happened at the hospital over the last several months. Uh, from residents, uh, nurses who have been organized for some time, and now the support staff. Uh, I think it's long past time that the hospital uh, pay workers what they're worth because everyone deserves a living wage. Everyone deserves safe working conditions and uh, stability that's offered by good benefits. So uh, just glad to support this tonight <clears throat> in solidarity with the support staff. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank Thank you very much, Councillor McGee. Are there any other, Councillor Grant? Thank you, I agree with what my fellow councillors just said, and I just wanted to throw out a couple of other educational points. Um, what we have seen with uh, the UVM Medical Center is a real denial of what it takes to survive in this city right now. I was recently made aware um, when I met with some constituents in the union about the housing at, at, at Market Street, how it's not really available to everyone based on the rules that they've put forth. Oh, this is gonna be available to all full-time people in the following order. Well, that order excludes a lot of you. Um, it is basically set up for travelers and residents based on the fact that you can only have one year lease and then maybe a second year lease and you have to have all this criteria. So it's not what, what the medical center put forth for it to be, oh, we're helping with housing. It's completely false. So um, I stand with you, I stand with you strong. I, I, the administration at the hospital, everyone knows, is very top heavy. Their inability to, you know, a lot of them don't live in Burlington, or if they live in Burlington, they don't live where we live, right? You know, I'm in the historic North End, and they don't understand what, affordable housing is not low-cost housing, right? And even if someone lives somewhere that's affordable, the way things are going right now with rent eviction, right? We're seeing people being told, not 100 or 50, we're seeing people be told, oh, you're going up $500, $600. So it's this, um, this lack of empathy, this lack of empathy, the lack of understanding that the chronic turnover that exists is not healthy for anyone. And no one should have to be in a position where they're working 15 hour days and they have the expectation that overtime is what's gonna make their bills. But work, not 15 hour days, 15, 15 hour days because your management can't do your job, um, and other things. So I could go on for a while, but I won't. I will leave it there. I just want to say I fully support you. Be strong. I know a lot of you continue to work with the hospital because you love each other, and you've got each other's backs, and the relationships that you form are very, very important to you. But um, that can only go so far. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Grant. Are there any other councillors who wish to speak to this resolution? Seeing none, we will go to a vote. Uh, all those in favor of the motion to waive the reading and adopt the resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That motion passes unanimously. And just, and, and just for, thank you, thank you. And, and just for the record, that was eight, eight in favor, um, two that are absent, and then two that are recused. That will move us on to the next item on our agenda, which is 6.6, .6, a communication, Heather Ross, Sheehy Furlong Beam, um, regarding a financial review of expenditures by racial equity, inclusion, and belonging department in fiscal years 21 and 2021 and 2022. Um, for the benefit of the, of, the, of the public that is watching, um, this is something that counselors are well aware of, but for everyone else's benefit, last week a request was made um, of the full city council that any questions that might require additional research or information from attorney Ross would be sent to the city attorney's office prior to the report being posted online on Thursday. Um, before we open up the floor to comments or additional questions from the council, um, it's my understanding that CAO Shad, you have the questions that have been asked um, and uh, if you could speak to, I'm not sure what format you wanted, if you want to just ask the, tell us what the questions were and then give us the answers to those questions uh, and, then we'll, and then we'll move on from there. Absolutely, thank you President Paul. Um, we did ask for questions in advance as much as possible and so I will just quickly go through uh, the questions that were asked. Um, I have sent answers back to each individual uh, counselor who asked them but for the benefit of everyone. Uh, we want to report out on them here. Um, the first question was on page three of the report in a footnote, I noticed Milo Grant appears as a Juneteenth musician. As a person paid by the department, would this create a conflict of interest in reviewing the report? If so, has Milo been informed of this conflict of interest? Our answer was under the conflict of interest provision of our city charter, the city's conflict of interest policy provides that no city officer shall participate in any fashion or cast a vote on any matter in which either a direct or indirect conflict of interest is present, nor shall a city officer participate or vote in any question in which participation or vote would reasonably create in the mind of an objective person the appearance of a direct or indirect conflict of interest. It goes on, um, and I won't read all of it, but um, the city attorney's office has discussed the charter provision with Councillor Grant, and under the charter, it is up to um, the counselor to disclose any conflict of interest should, there, should they feel there is such a conflict, or for the council to make that determination um, by a two-thirds vote. The second question um, says, the first sentence of paragraph three on page two says the report may contain confidential information. Is this report public or confidential? Um, the answer is that language is simply boilerplate language and included to help protect the law firm that created it. The administration has reviewed to ensure everything in the report can be released publicly. Question three, on page two, there are businesses listed in the footnote as not registered to do business in Vermont. However, many of these businesses are familiar to us. Examples, Hannaford, Hotel Vermont, et cetera. Um, and my response was, it appears this counselor could have misread the footnote on the page because the, it says, these vendors are not included and were not subject to the Secretary of State search because they are well-known entities. The next question is also 
Um, just a clarification, it says on page three in the footnote, Andrew Champagne is listed as a musician. To my knowledge, he is not a musician. Um, our answer was this was an error as Andrew was hired alongside musicians and entertainment as part of a slate. Andrew was hired to register voters. Next question. On page eight, it, the report references an invitation only black tie event at Hula on June 17th, 2022 to honor members of the black com community. Do we know the cost of the event? Who was invited? What were they asked to pay? And what was the criteria for the invitation? Um, the response was, this was not specifically reviewed in the assignment. It was out of scope. The next question was, Noble Jewels was paid $50,000 for culturology. What is that and do we have more details? I provided to the counselor who asked the request um, that was made by the REIB to the Board of Finance in September 2021 for this work. That memo described a uh, cultural transformation and included a culture gap analysis, community assessment, and creating a strategy and action plan. Next question. Keisha Ram was paid $1,000 to speak at what, for how long, and was there a precedent for paying a local politician to speak? I responded, uh, she spoke at Juneteenth FY22 event, and it is not clear how long she spoke and if there was precedent, as that was outside the scope. There were two questions that relied on a copy and paste, and the copy and paste did not come through, so I'm going to skip those. The next question was, how much did the report cost? The report cost $41,000. The firm interviewed 10 current and former city employees and examined 77,000 emails and other documents. Please note that Baker Tilly, which led the internal review in Minneapolis, was paid $175,000 for its work. They interviewed 13 current and former city employees and examined 285,000 emails. The next question. I, I'm sorry, could you repeat those amounts again, please? Sure. Um, we paid $41,000, um, and our report, uh, our investigation um, interviewed 10 current, former, and current and former city employees and examined 77,000 emails. And in Minneapolis, they were paid $175,000 interviewed 13 current and former city employees and examined 285,000 emails. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat those amounts again, please? I think We'd, you've heard it. I'll I, it. I, I, so the total is $216,000. I just want to be very clear about this. No, we paid 41,000. We paid 41. And, and Minneapolis then, paid 175,000. The city of Minneapolis, city of Minneapolis for paid, their report. As a way of comparison, did the contracting follow? Did the contracting I, follow procurement procedures? And if yes, what was that process? Yes, it did. We developed a scope of work and looked for a lawyer to take on the work. We made calls and talked to three different lawyers, three different law firms. Most firms did not have the expertise or availability to take on the work and the only one that responded positively was Heather Ross at Sheehy Furlong and Beam. Heather has previous experience conducting these kinds of investigations, was willing to offer a governmental discount on her firm's pricing, and was not conflicted out of the work. What steps are being taken to address the recommendations by the administration? We are following up on each recommendation in the report and will report back on them to the Board of Finance and City Council. The Clerk Treasurer's Office will take responsibilities for these efforts. They include developing and implementing a process to make the Board of Finance aware of the Juneteenth budget 
and any other large events for any other department well in advance of the event, developing and holding annual reminder trainings regarding purchasing requirements, strengthening our conflict of interest policy so that employees are required to disclose any actual or apparent conflict of interest, not limiting it to immediate financial interests. We will establish a robust fraud, waste, and abuse policy to ensure all employees are encouraged to report mismanagement or more serious conduct promptly so follow-up action can be taken. We will establish a policy that sets forth when or to what extent out-of-town or out-of-state vendors are allowed to have lodging and travel expenses paid for by the city. We will formalize requirements that all contractors must be registered to do business in Vermont. And we will document the requirement that contracts can only be executed by a person with a sufficient level of authority. The next question was, where is the budget amendment that increased the June 2022 budget from 100,000 to 180,000? I attached two different budget amendments um, in my response back. The first amendment took $90,000 from the FY21 fund balance for the REIB department, added it to the 2022 Juneteenth budget, and a second amendment took 10,000 from that 90,000 and took it for computers. We have a question about, um, we have some more questions. Um, is this how we want to continue? There's about four or five more questions along this line. My apologies, I'm sorry. What, what did you say? There's just about four or five more questions like this. Is this helpful? Do you want me to continue? If there are four, and, and they are able to be answered publicly, then yes. Excellent. I'm just feeling like I'm droning on here, but. Um, okay. Our 2023 budget reflects in the 2022 amended budget $720,000 for use of fund balance. What is this? This is money that was carried over from the original $1 million obligated in FY21 towards the Fund for Racial Justice. And as it is spent, it, is show, it shows up in budget amendments. Our 2023 budget shows 68,000 in donations for special events, but the report says we raised $103,000. Why is there a discrepancy? Did some of the money come in 2023? Yes, some of the money came in after the FY23 budget closed. If you look at the FY24 REIB proposed budget, you will see the $103,000 in donation special events under actuals. The mayor's 2023 budget includes 1.2 million of CARES Act revenue for REIB. Has that been received? Is it guaranteed? This was ARPA money that was set aside for FY23 for REIB salaries. It is only funded as it's incurred. Due to limited staffing for REIB in FY23, we funded the entire salary amount. This is only about $740,000 and not the full $1.2 million anticipated. There are a number of people listed as BCA. Why is that? I'm sorry, President Paul, just point of information. I think at, at this point, this question rides the line of attorney-client privilege and the counselor who asked the question would have to waive, choose to waive that um, in terms of the formation of the advice that was given. This specific, quest, this specific question. Um, so why don't we go to the next question then? I mean, I... I is there accounting for Juneteenth specifically? Can you show me accounting that adds up to 412,000 for the event? Yes, we can meet up, a t yes, we can set up a time to meet and we can show this to you. Is exhibit 1A of the report intended to be a summary of all REIB spending for FY22? Yes. 
who were the recipients of the $25,000 of gift cards from City Market and the $60,000 gift cards from Hannaford's. This was out of scope for the report, but we can find out. There was another question about Noble Jewels. I've already answered that. And then the last question, if we were overcharged for goods received or paid for services we did not receive from vendors, do we have any recourse? This would be contract specific. The city attorney's office would need to review the terms of the contract document to determine if there was a breach of contract and evaluate the strength of any possible claim the city may have towards recovering funds already paid. Thank That's you, all. CA. Thank you, CA Oshad. Um, I will go to Councillor Hightower. Um, I will not be making the motion on board docs. Instead, I would move to not accept the memorandum financial review of expenditures by IRB in fiscal years 21 and 22, but instead refer both of the materials posted under this as supporting documents to, to the HR committee to consider a full public articulation of harm from Mayor Merrill Weinberger and the City of Burlington to Taisha Green, Casey Ellerby, and their families for the continued defamation of character and war unwarranted actions taken through city processes like the audit itself and an apology of the same. I also asked the HR, or we also asked the HR committee to establish a process for independent evaluation and oversight of the hiring and retention policies and solutions employed by the City of Burlington to combat anti-BAPAC and gender-based discriminatory practices. And I would like the floor back after a second. Second. Uh, thank you, seconded by Councilor Bergman. Um, before we go any further and before you have the floor back, that is a long <laughs> motion and something that we're going to need to have so that we can all see that. Do you have, I, I take it you were reading that. Um, is that something that you can send to, um, to the clerk? Yes, sending now. And I also do wanna add that we do have Councilor Carpenter also joining us. So we have Councilor Carpenter and Councilor McGee who are joining us via Zoom. I've sent it to the clerk with copy to the city council. Um, I will start talking while you all review that. Um, also during um, the late hours of the day, and I apologize for the lateness, it just <laughs> didn't get done until this afternoon. Um, there's also in the agenda packet a memorandum in response to the Heather E. Ross, she before long and BMPC memorandum regarding financial review of expenditures by the REIB committee. Um, I'd like to read some of those and then go to my own comments. Um, and I think some of this was stated in public forum, but I think it's important to have a full summary. Um, the first is that Juneteenth 2021 was the city's first Juneteenth and the only Juneteenth that was managed and executed by former director Taisha Green. There was no mismanagement found of the 2021 Juneteenth event in this review or in any other accusations, anything. There was never any issue with anything Juneteenth 2021. Um, as a matter of fact, it was under budget and one of the city's largest events of the year was well attended, well celebrated, had more private funds going into it than city funds. It was by all, all measures a great success. There is no reason why Director Green should have been the focus of a 2022 Juneteenth event review. When she gave notice in February 2022, the event was on track. As with June 2021, vendors had not been hired and the theme had not been selected. No financial commitments had been made. If there was any financial mismanagement of the 2022 event, it happened after the departure of Director Green. The review was focused on whether or not abuse, waste, or fraud occurred. The review, review did not find any such mismanagement for 2021 or 2022. The problem with the memorandum is it creates the appearance of mismanagement by former Director Green throughout especially surrounding Juneteenth 2022. 
The report continually seems to accuse the former director without providing support or analysis for these accusations or even concluding mismanagement on Director Green's part, casting doubt on the fairness of its focus with regard to Mrs. Green. Yet the media and certain members of the council took it upon themselves to still associate Director Green directly with mismanagement of the 22 event. And again, the memo itself did some speculation of this in ways that I'll cover later. Given both the findings of this review in the conclusion section, not the whole rest of it, and the recent TIF review, the issues raised around the management of June 20, Juneteenth 2022 appear to be emblematic of a citywide culture and the lack of clarity and enforcement around city policies. Specifically going back to the TIF review, we note that their concerns was that much of the, the audit showed years of sloppy record keeping and financial mismanagement while noting that Burlington has made millions of dollars of mistakes. Much of this was attributed to poor record keeping, key staff turnover, and slow adoption of stra strategies recommended by the city's own auditors. We know REIB also had tremendous staff turnover right around the time of Taisha's departure because several of her staff also left once she resigned. This review was based on an accusation of something happening somewhere else, an accusation that was never substantiated, and this review found no mismanagement attributable to former Director Green. Meanwhile, we have documented instances of other department heads in Burlington violating practices and mismanaging city resources. Yet, former Director Green is the only department head to be publicly reviewed in this way. We invite the administration to strongly consider a potential bias in their response. If people would like to review the memorandum itself, it provides all of the evidence, much of it from the audit, the review, uh, the financial review itself. Some of the other folks, um, some of the other issues that the city has had is retroactive approval of a five-year, $400,000 contract signed by another director, um, which they did not have authority to sign, which was in a, someone who had much more experience and was at the, with the city much longer than Taisha Green. Um, we've had a we had a complaint that went to the city of a director using city resources for personal use without documenting if it was for work or for um, personal use, and the mayor recommended that that person be removed. And we still didn't do an audit, a public audit of this of this way on that person. Um, in January of this year, um, we had a incident in, with the Burlington Police Department where we know that there was a contract signed with a private HOA after um, refusing calls for service and citing staff shortages. Um, and there was no action done other than just asking if anything else was amiss within the department. And in 2016, Peter Owens left his position from the city of Burlington, which was the CETO director directly related to housing um, and being a good faith liaison between landlords and tenants um, after, and then resigned early in response to an illegal and inhumane eviction in San Francisco. Again, another event that happened outside of the city of Burlington, but related and nothing was done. We're not saying that the reaction for other directors should have been more punitive or stronger, but it does feel Notable that the accusations against former Director Green and the response to them seem disproportionate. It feels very similar to the mayor's removal of former Director Green as manager of the CNA contract, which he later apologized for, noting the decision was wrong and revealed my own bias. I'm gonna keep going. I know I'm taking up a lot of time, but I less, I'm usually a very short-winded counselor, so today I think is the day to take up the space. For two years, I worked very hard with the mayor to try to convince him to make the right decisions, and I don't think I was ever successful. When I joined the city council, I consider him an acquaintance, if not a friend. He was the only Burlington mayoral candidate I had ever voted for. I put hours of work my first two years of council to, make, to try to make the mayor see the issues and move towards racial justice. On every single decision, even on decisions where he said he would find a way to follow my advice, he ultimately rejected it. The CNA report is an excellent example of this. 
I asked the mayor to not remove Taisha from the CN report and that his viewpoint that the BU director was more qualified and less biased than Taisha was problematic. It fell on deaf ears. For those of you who follow this, you know that was one of the few things that made it to the public eye and maybe the only one that the mayor apologized for. And that's why it's important to believe black women because it shouldn't have to take an outcry for someone to do what is right. I can't trust what you say because I can see what you do. James Baldwin. I do not know what is in the mayor's heart of hearts. And honestly, to me, that's not what defines racism. What defines racism is if and how actions systemically negatively impact BIPOC people. And on every decision I've watched the mayor make, he's chosen the one that negatively impacts BIPOC people. And this is another example. As a black woman, I know what it's like to have to be above reproach. Our mayor does not know what that's like. He can keep the knowledge of department heads trolling activists on like, online with fake social media accounts a secret and still win elections. He can fund his friends' nonprofits. He can publicly be racist and still be elected. Councillor Hightower. I am really sorry, Karen, but I'm gonna have to finish this. It is all relevant, I promise. Some of us don't have that advantage. We have to be above reproach because whatever is said about us, true or not, it sticks and it closes the few doors that are open for us. This report was incredibly muddy and unclear, but if you go through all of it, the vague accusations and attacks against Taisha Green and Darcy Ellerby, you will find no wrongdoing. No fraud, no mismanagement, no disruptive city policies, that doesn't stop the media from running headlines showing Taisha's face next to the headline claiming mismanagement. That doesn't stop some people at this table from getting in front of a camera and saying otherwise. Taisha Green did nothing during our time here that deserves any level of scrutiny. The reason this is in front of us today is because her relationship with the mayor, much like mine, eroded when her comments went from advice to just pointing out the inherent and systemic racism in the mayor's decisions. Another problematic thing that we've seen in other things that I'm worried happened in this report is the mayor getting involved in the actual content of the reports. He did this with the CNA report, which he had to do publicly, given that Taisha was managing it. I had a really hard time reading this report as a objective document. For example, on page nine, it says, there were multiple times when Mrs. Green was made aware of the city's purchasing policy, which specifically references sole source contracts. The chief administrative officer provided Ms. Green with a copy of the city's purchasing policy early in her employment. That seems like a stretch. <laughs> When we asked Ms. Eller, where Ms. Ellerby stayed during the Juneteenth 22 and whether in her opinion it would have been appropriate for the city to pay for Ms. Ellerby's hotel given that she was a city employee, Ms. Green stated that she did not know where Ms. Ellerby stayed. She then stated she believed that Ms. Ellerby stayed with Dr. Jackie. Taisha Green was not an employee of the city of Burlington in Juneteenth 2022. Her opinion on where people should have stayed or not stayed is quite frankly irrelevant. And I feel like this report is doing a weird trying to gotcha moments throughout this whole thing. Another thing, write the paragraph below. When asked about the contract for which the Vermont Professionals of Color Network, and more specifically the Vermont Health Equity Initiative, was the subrecipient of a substantial American Rescue Plan Act fund, Ms. Green stated that she was not familiar with that contract. When read an email in which she was copied describing the services of the contract, including that it was for ongoing vaccination support through community partners, Ms. Green stated it sounded like a good idea, but she did not have any involvement with it. Being copied on an email <laughs> as a director of a department does not mean you know the content of every email that you've gotten. Furthermore, the report then goes on to say that she had no decision-making authority and who the contract was awarded to anyway. So why is she being questioned on this? Why is that even in the report? Councillor Hightower. I am almost done. I'm really sorry, but again, I feel like this is one of the few times that I've actually taken up space to talk on something, and I think this is important. Because another decision that the mayor made, and let me be clear, this was not a mistake, this is a tactic he commonly uses, he made sure to only release the memo to the council as a confidential document so that we can't talk about it. He made sure that the two subjects of the review didn't have it so they couldn't talk about it. He sent it to the media along so that he could control the narrative. In this way, he silenced the voice of Taisha, the voice of Jersey, my voice, to ensure there would be a narrative that Taisha was somehow the cause of any mistakes made in 2022. 
but the mistakes made in 2022 are systemic and they are always for the same reason and were highlighted in the TIF audit a few months ago. I already read that section. Channel 3 asked me today why I stand behind this memo and why I'm standing up. Because Taisha could be me. Taisha has been me. Speaking the truth privately so as not to undermine white fragility and moving on means her former boss started a witch hunt over a year later so that every time her name is Googled, the word fraud comes up. Some of us at this table may feel like we know what it's like to be Taisha. I've received death threats. I've received death threats and letters to my home. A lot of us at this table have been threatened in really problematic ways, including the mayor. The difference is we got those based on our actions, based on our votes, based on our words. Taisha Green got it based on who she is and false accusations against her. She didn't choose this path, and that is really worlds apart. So I think this. <laughs> Um, I think that the, I, thanks for letting me speak this whole time. I realize I'm out of line, but I appreciate getting the time. <laughs> you know what? This is not the night to, to, to silent the voices of black women. So you're not out of line. Mr. Mayor, you need to apologize for how you handled this. You need to apologize for running Taisha out of the city government. You need to apologize for decimating the REIB department. And if you can't do that, Burlington can heal until you're just a memory. Joan, you lied on the news. You personally own Taisha in the apology. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Before, before we continue with the motion, um, and I, I see you, Councilor Grant, just a moment. Um, I believe the city, uh, city attorney, acting city attorney Pellerin has um, some comments on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the motion. President Paul, I, I would just caution the city council that um, this, the body, there's advice that of, of the city attorney's office that could be provided to them, of course, if they would consider it an executive session on the motion at hand and how, how best to move forward out of um, concern for the legality of, of moving forward with the motion as written. So my, my understanding of that is what you are saying is that before, just want to make sure I understand, before we would go any further with this motion, that you would encourage us to either make, a, make motions to go into executive session to receive legal advice on the motion, or... That, that is correct. That is okay. my advice to the body. I, I would recommend that. Point of information. Uh, yes, Councillor Hightower. If, if I please, please let us do this, please. If I change the motion to read continued alleged defamation, will that be sufficient, or would you still advise us to go into executive session? Do you, do you want do you want to feel free? Do you to maybe want to be able to discuss this so that we can come back with a motion that we might be able to vote on. Yes, if we may, if, if we session. may have a, a minute of recess for me to discuss that with Councilor okay. Hightower under attorney-client, then I would appreciate that. Thank you. Is that okay with you, Councilor Hightower? Great. We will. Uh, it is now 9:38. We will recess for five minutes. Uh, we're going to reconvene the meeting at 9:49. If councilors could take their seats.
Okay, thank you. And uh, again, we're recon we are reconvening. Um, we are reconvening the meeting, um, and we also have Councillor. We still have Councillor McGee and Councillor Carpenter joining us via Zoom. Uh, Councillor Hightower, did you want to um, amend your motion and then send uh, send that to us? I've but you can certainly read it first. I've just sent it um, to the clerk and the city council. Um, I would move to, I would like to amend my motion to move to refer the materials posted under this item as supporting documents to the HR committee to consider the full impact of this report on our city, Taisha Green, Casey Ellerby, and their families. We further refer these materials to the HR committee to establish a process for independent evaluation oversight of the hiring and retention policies and solutions employed by the city of Burlington to combat anti-BIPOC and gender-based discriminatory practices. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Hightower. Um, uh, City Attorney Pellerin, I just want to make sure that I'm doing this correctly. There was a motion on the floor. It had been seconded. Um, and, and the maker is now amending, and no one had, we have not voted, we did not vote on that, and, nor did we discuss it. So um, the maker is now amending their motion. Is that permissible? Yes, we just need a second, I believe, President Paul. Okay, so second. a seconded by Councillor Bergman. Um, Councillor Hightower, do you wish to have the floor back or can we move on to others? We can move on. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any councillors who wish to speak to the motion before us? Seeing none, and I'm just looking up on the on the screen uh, to Councillor McGee or Councillor Carpenter. I don't see their hands up either. Um, given that, we can then go to a vote. Um, all those in favor of the motion as made by Councillor Hightower and seconded by Councillor Bergman, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. That motion passes unanimously. And that will close out that agenda item. We will then move on to item number 6.7, 6 which is a communication, Jared Pellerin, acting city attorney, on the redistricting rollout. And for this item, I will return back to attorney Pellerin. If you could just give us a brief overview of the memo, and then we will go to the council if there are any questions. Of course, thank you, President Paul. And good evening, councillors, again. Um, so CAO Shad, myself, and other members of the city team have been working alongside the mayor's office as well on implement, how does the recent charter change to redistrict the city of Burlington affect town meeting day going forward in, a, in our elections? And as you'll see in the memo that we've provided to the council this evening, we're lucky this time around, things pretty much stay status quo for us. And we, because of the good work of the city council and the administration of keeping the eight wards, four district scheme, we will have all of the ward councilors coming up for election as they would in 2024, along with the mayor's seat and the school commissioners who are elected as the ward city councilors are elected. So there is no real change to that, luckily. And then the four district councilors will remain in their seat and represent the districts that they were elected because they are still legal resident voters of the district who reside in the district. The boundary did not displace any of them. Of the 50 some odd seats that elected seats that we have in the city of Burlington, of those, eight were technically displaced because the boundary line moved and elected out of their ward or district. And in those cases, four of the electeds would actually be up for re-election anyways. So we don't consider them truly displaced, but the, there are four who unfortunately will no longer reside in the district or ward that they were elected to represent, and being that part of the qualification for being elected is that you are a resident of that ward or district, they will have to step down from their seat, and a run, and that seat will be 
up for election at town meeting day 2024. And the city council will have, as they do under their authority, the opportunity to appoint acting election officials. And in that, as you'll see in the um, memorandum, I, I did list where those wards are affected and which specific positions. And we have the city clerk's office, along with the city attorney's office, are working to communicate with those four that have been affected by the boundary redraw. And for some of them, there will also be the opportunity in their new district award to run for the same position that they have been displaced out of their previous ward or district. So that's a long way of saying that for the most part, everything is is pretty status quo in, in terms of town meeting day 2024. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any uh, counselors wishing to speak on this communication uh, or have any questions? Okay, um, so uh, then I guess we'll just need a motion. Um, Councilor Doherty, maybe perhaps you could make that uh, recommended motion. Thank you, President Paul. I uh, move to waive the reading, accept the motion, and place it, or accept the memo and place it in the file. Thank you, Councilor Doherty. Seconded by um, Councilor Travers. Is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. And that will bring us, that is, brings us to the end of our deliberative agenda. Um, we do still have um, the, meeting, the meeting that we have not gotten to yet that we do need to attend to tonight, which is the city council with mayor presiding. So at 9.56, I will recess the city council meeting and hand the gavel to Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, President Paul. Give me just one moment. We'll get that agenda open. So I would like to call into order the City Council with Mayor presiding at 9.57 p.m. and would welcome motion on the agenda. Move to adopt the agenda. Uh, was that... Um, second. Commission Doherty, second by, oh, oh sorry. Uh, uh, Councilor Travis, seconded by President Paul. Any discussion of the agenda? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Motion carries unanimously. That brings us to the consent agenda. Move to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Second. second. Thank you both. Any discussion of the consent agenda? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda passes unanimously. And that brings us to um, four uh, board and commission appointments. The first one is a conservation uh, board appointment for the term expiring June 30th, 2027. The floor is open for nominations. Councilor Barlow. I'd like to nominate Pauline Swiss Lockie. Thank you. Are there any additional nominations? Are there any additional nominations? Seeing none, we will close the floor of nominations. Um, don't believe is are any of the candidates on uh, online, President Paul. Just a moment. Uh, where are we, Diana Wood? Uh, not that I, not that I can see. No. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, any discussion of the nomination? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of appointing Pauline Swislaki, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, Pauline, if you're watching. Uh, thank you for your interest in serving. Um, <clears throat> next, we'll go to the Development Review Board full position term expiring June 30th, 2026. The floor is open for nominations.
Councillor Barlow. I nominate Leo Sprinzen. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? Any other nominations? Seeing none, um, we'll close, close the Florida nominations. Is there any discussion of, and I'm assuming we don't have anyone with us online. Um, any discussion of the appointment? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Um, <clears throat> Um, okay, I just uh, consulted with our new busy deputy city attorney, um, and um, we have a situation with the next appointment where um, the only application we've received is for Romeo von Herman, who we appointed earlier tonight to the um, <clears throat> to the Church Street Marketplace Commission. So, Councillor Paul, uh, thank you. Um, I would make a motion that we re-advertise. Okay, um, I... Unless you can serve on two. I, we weren't 100% sure. I'm feeling like I remember something that you can't serve on two. Um, we were either going to suggest that or that we... Postpone? Uh, postpone it until September, but um, maybe re-advertising would be prudent. We don't even know if... I, I'm not sure Mr. Von Herman would be interested in serving both. Perhaps we need to find out the answer to that question before we go and re-advertise. We do have someone who is very interested in serving, and if they can serve on two, they, they, he, he, he might well do that. He is, he is joining us online if you wanted to, if we wanted to ask him. I think that, yes, Councilor, Councilor Paul, I, or President Paul, excuse me, I, I admittedly don't know the answer to this question right off the top of my head, and so I would suggest tabling this to the September meeting um, in order to give time to do the appropriate research, because I think it would be only fair to the applicant that if they are permitted to serve on two, that they be considered um, since they have applied at this point. So then I would make a motion to postpone to the September 11th meeting. Sorry. One quick thought I have on that is perhaps the motion could include the possibility that if if the charter, as I think it says, that that is not a possibility, that we then have the authority to go ahead and re-advertise uh, instead of losing a month. And, and point of information, Charter Section 131 says that no member of a commission provided for in this charter shall be eligible to serve as a member of any other such a commission, comma, except that a planning commissioner may be a member of a development review board. So I think the charter is clear. And that's the advice from your former assistant city, senior assistant city attorney. Thank you, Councillor Bergman. I appreciate that. Then, then uh, are we saying that the motion should really go back to the original one, which is a motion to re-advertise? Yes? Yes. All right, then I would make the motion that we re-advertise the position. Any discussion of the motion? Seeing none, let's go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, um, the final appointment is for the Board of Registration of Voters for a term expiring June 30th, 2028. Are, um, are there any nominations? The floor is open for nominations. Councilor Bergman. Uh, I would nominate Olga Bravo who has some very good experience um, and also has, um, in terms of life experience, the fact that she lived in Chile in the 1970s means I think she has a serious interest in maintaining democracy. Thank you, Councilor Bergman. Are there any other nominations? Are there any? Other nominations? Seeing none, I will close the floor to nominations. And is there any other discussion of, of the appointment of Olga Bravo? 
Seeing none, um, let's go to the a vote. All those in favor of the appointment of Olga Bravo, please say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? <coughs> the uh, nomination is, the appointment is approved unanimously. And thank you, uh, Olga, for your interest. I want to thank, and uh, good luck in that important role. I want to say thank you to everyone who applied this round and encourage people who were not successful with appointing their appointment this time to consider applying again in the future as uh, many of our commissioners, that is the route they've taken to getting on the board. Um, with that, um, at 10.05, if there's no objection, um, we are adjourned as a city council with mayor presiding as there's no further business. Th thank you, Mayor Weinberger. So we will reconvene the uh, recessed meeting of the City Council at 10.05. We have just a few items left to complete our agenda. The first is item seven, which is committee reports. Are there councilors who wish to offer a committee report? Councilor Barlow. Uh, thank you, President Paul. Uh, Took is meeting tomorrow night, Tuesday at 5 p.m. at the Burlington Electric Department, 585 Pine Street, to continue deliberation and hopefully conclude them. Uh, on the carbon pollution impact fee ordinance before that ordinance makes its way on to the ordinance committee. Tuke is also meeting for our regularly scheduled meeting on Tuesday, uh, the 22nd at 5 p.m. at 645 Pine Street. The agenda is still being set, but we will have the airport staff there to address suggestions for new ordinance to control noise and fuel efficiency standards at the airport. Thank you so much, Councilor Barlow. Are there any other uh, committee? Committee reports, anyone who wishes to offer a committee report? Councillor Bergman? So your your joint um, charter change and ordinance committee on oversight has met a few times. I think that we are needing to um, to, to set new uh, new meetings and I, I know that um, I got a message and I don't mean to embarrass anybody when I say that uh, I, I uh, Councillors Travers, uh, Shannon, and Carpenter uh, would it would be greatly appreciated about the uh, the doodle poll, um, which has been out there for a while, so that we can set up a another meeting. But we're really looking to um, uh, to have a, a discussion on the um, on people's different paths forward. And I think we've settled that uh, we need to uh, to put those in front of us and see where. Um, we can get consensus where we can get majority and uh, where we can move. And so that is really what the next step is going to be, trying to uh, lay out the, the various paths that people think um, would be appropriate and then test those uh, in, the, uh, in the committee. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Bergman. Uh, any other committee reports before we move uh, Councilor Travers. Uh, I would just say thank you for the re report. Uh, Co-Chair Bergman, um, I will say that I think one of the voices uh, to be heard on Steps Forward is uh, the police commission in this process, and I know that they are also, while this is not really a committee report as much as it's a commission report on their behalf, I know they are also continuing to review and um, hoping to provide more formal answers to our joint committee on the direction that the current iteration of the police commission would like to go in. Um, the doodle poll referenced by Councilor Bergman, rightfully so, is also a poll that we'll hope to use on the ordinance committee for uh, scheduling our next standalone meeting. Uh, there are a couple matters that uh, will be pending before the ordinance committee, including uh, the um, graffiti and stickering ordinance that the council passed is pending before the ordinance committee for review. Um, as well as uh, once the uh, TUC is done with their review of the Carbon Pollution Impact Fee Ordinance, it will be forwarded to the Ordinance Committee for their review as well. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor uh, Travers. Uh, I will add one uh, other committee report. The Public Safety Committee will be reading on August 17th. Um, we're going to be doing it remotely only at 6 p.m. Uh, we're going to continue among other items, going to continue our discussion about drug activity and neighborhoods as well as uh, the possible establish establishment or um, organizing forums to talk about drug activity um, with various constituencies. Um, if there are no other 
committee reports. Uh, we will move on to item number eight, which is City Council General City Affairs. Are there any councillors who wish to offer comments on General City Affairs? Councillor Hightower. Um, I just want to note the passing of, um, I knew him as Omar from Kismayo Kitchen um, last week. I think we lost a really valued member of the community and just want to recognize him and how much he did for the community. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Are there any other councillors who have any comments on general city affairs? Uh, um, thank you, Councillor Grant. Um, there really wasn't a place to put this, so I'm choosing this moment. I'll be quick. I um, had a couple of comments that we need to be really careful about how we make decisions in the city when we look at other places and what they're doing, we have to understand, have an understanding of what's, what's going on there. Um, the city of Minneapolis had a truth and reconciliation committee. And uh, those committee members, after facing exhaustion, gaslighting, et cetera, left. City council and the mayor have declared racism as a public health emergency. Well, what has come of that? How has that been operationalized? It hasn't. Sound familiar, right? Um, 75 current and former city staff signed a letter criticizing racist, toxic work culture of the city of Minneapolis. And then the uh, previous director, before Taisha Green started working in, in Minneapolis, wrote an op-ed eviscerating the city for their lack of support, the fact that they only cared about optics and not making real change. It's a very interesting read. I'll forward it to the city councilors. I'll forward it to the mayor. And then lastly, the city, not just the police department, but the city and the police department are under consent degree uh, from the Department of Justice. So we have to pay attention to what's going on in other places and make really smart decisions, do we want to take leads from them? Um, I think we made a mistake there. I think what they've done based on how they've treated people that are trying to make change, and we all know it happened in Minneapolis, and it's systemic, and it's been going on for a while, and why are we, we listening to them given their history? I think we also have to be very careful that we don't provide red meat for racists in our country. You know, this Vermont Digger article was shared on Twitter by a MAGA extremist. It has caused great harm to individuals, um, name calling, death threats, and, and this is, what's going on about Burlington. And every time I read the comments and I see Taisha's name, that's my name. I see uh, insulting DEI programs. I see myself. I see my family. I see my nieces. I see my mother, my aunts. I see all my family. You know, when they talk about Camilla, <laughs> knee pads, Harris, and things like that. This is what we have opened up. This is our contribution. We did that. And we have to do better. And the last thing I will say, I was really struck by the comment about how we have to keep harm from public, the public eye, because I've been in that position. I've taken a lot of hits when I served on the police commission because I was trying to bring to, truth to power to some very unfortunate things that are happening here in our city. And you have to be mindful of how you present yourself because the attitude very much is how dare you, right? You're difficult. You can't be reasoned with. I think we need to think more about these things. The people that were here tonight are not the only ones affected. They, they made the time to be here, some people couldn't. 
I think that we, we say we're going to do a lot of things, but we don't act on it. And that only makes things worse. Like what is really truly getting better? And I hope that we all support the current director of the REIB department because she's feeling this too. And I don't think that's right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Uh, if there are no other counselors who have comments on general city affairs, that will move us to uh, item nine, which is council president updates. I have no updates at this time. I figure you all hear from me plenty. Um, and we'll be in touch with you in September as we get closer to the next meeting. Um, that will move us to item 10, which is updates from the mayor. Uh, mayor Maru Wein Mayor Weinberger, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Paul. I just have one um, update. Um, the public and counselors may have seen the uh, report that we released last week that uh, we already in the month of August have exceeded the overdose, city overdose responses um, for all of 2022. And um, given that, given uh, the ongoing challenge and the ongoing work that's needed uh, in this area, I just want to make sure everyone's aware that August 31st is International Overdose Awareness Day and uh, it will be in City Hall Park. There was an or earlier plan for it to be in Montpelier, but um, that uh, has, has changed and you can find more information online. Thank you, President Paul. Thank you so much, Mayor Weinberger. Uh, that brings us to the end of our agenda and uh, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bergman, seconded by uh, Councillor Travers. Uh, all those in favor of the motion to adjourn, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. We are adjourned. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Our next meeting is Monday, September 11th, uh, and we will look forward to seeing you then. Have a good evening.